Welcome to Table Talk, the place for deep conversations in the Geekverse. And trust me, when we tear into a subject, we go deep. I'm Heath, and I'll be your host. Each episode, I'll be talking with one or more creators, authors, illustrators, publishers, or other movers and shakers in games, TV, books, movies, or other areas of the Geekverse. Regular guests include Douglas A. Burton, the author of Far Away Bird, a multi-award-winning historical fiction novel of the Byzantine Empress Theodora. He's also the author of The Heroine's Labyrinth, an alternative story structure to the hero's journey that often occurs in stories with feminine heroes. That structural framework frequently comes up in our analysis of story. Brianna De Silva, she's the director and co-writer of The Cultists, a Lovecraftian comedy mockumentary-style web show here on YouTube, and the author of The City of Reckoning, an epic fantasy novel of political intrigue, the ethics of war, and young love. Cameron Pasha is a screenwriter, director, novelist, and was a writer and producer on the series Kings, a producer on NBC's Bionic Woman, and a co-producer and writer for Sleeper Cell. He's also written for the CW series Nikita and Roswell, New Mexico. He's been breaking news from inside Lucasfilm, Disney, and Hollywood. His analysis and commentary have become very popular on YouTube. We regularly meet to discuss and analyze stories, and when we do, we dive into graduate-level seminars on story structure and writing. Come on in and let's go deep. And when I say we're going deep, I mean you'd better bring your hard suit. Other guests have included Lou Anders, the author of the Thrones and Bones fantasy novels, Once Upon a Unicorn, the creator and publisher of the Norengard RPG, and the author of Star Wars, A Pirate's Price, the book that explains why the Millennium Falcon is on the planet Batu at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Mark Tassin, the creator of the World of Ataltus, head of Mechanical Muse, former director of the Gen Con Writers Symposium, and the head developer of the new cool name RPG. Let's see, who else? Bond. James Bond. Well, not James Bond. Not yet. Maybe soon, though. But I have interviewed Jamie Stegmeier, the founder of Stonemeyer Games, crowdfunder extraordinaire, and publisher of many hit board games like Scythe and Wingspan. Brian Colin, sculptor of the world of Revelo, Monster Busts, and the creator of the vast, grim, dark horror RPG. Ajit George, the Dungeons & Dragons author, we talked about game writing, education, and his contribution to Van Richter's Guide to Ravenloft, and the development of the journeys to the Radiant Citadel. I am Hela, Odin's firstborn, commander of the legions of Asgard, the rightful heir to the throne, and the goddess of death. Well, actually, that interview got rather spicy, so I think I'd better just keep that one to myself. Kate Wilson, a YouTuber, actress, host, and prolific geek guru who's now working to make a new show dedicated to the world of tabletop gaming a reality. So buckle up and get ready for a wild ride, because it's time to explore the worlds of tabletop gaming, sci-fi, fantasy, and all of geekdom through the eyes of those who are making things happen. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Roger. Ready to move out. It's time. For Table Talk. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Table Talk. Welcome to my house. Welcome to the office. It is so good to see everyone. Tonight is a very special night here tonight on Table Talk because we have finally come to the point where Doug is launching his book, The Heroine's Labyrinth. And we've got a, a few different activities right here. We're doing, you know, Doug is doing a physical launch party on Tuesday. The book is actually scheduled to come out on Tuesday, but we wanted to do, and he's doing a physical party for that uh, that night, but we wanted to do a virtual launch party for his book, and so we put together a, a very different kind of table talk experience. This is the first time we've ever done a table talk like this before. We're having a rolling panel coming in. We're going to be having about a, a three-hour discussion, but what we did is we, def we, we invited Basically, everyone who was has has been a significant part of the Heroines Labyrinth and has been having uh, the discussion with us over you know, really the past year here on Table Talk about this this story structure. And so we just invited everyone. Uh, we assigned some different times, but this is done in rolling panel format, so people can come in, uh, you know, stay as long as they can. We can talk to them. We've got things to talk to them about, and then. Um, 
you know, they can leave and then we'll bring bring new people in. So this place is we got we've got topics to talk about with everyone. But this is also a celebration of everything that has been going on with the Heroines Labyrinth and all of the work that Doug has been doing. So first, let me welcome Douglas A. Burton. Hey, <laughs> hey Doug. What's happening, everybody? <laughs> welcome. Do you want to I mean, this is your day. Oh, man. Unbelievable. You know, and, and here on Table Talk, like this is the place where we have like put all of this to the test. Everyone in the chat uh, here now and that will be, I mean, been has been a part of this. And uh, Heath, what you've given me uh, in terms of like a chance to discuss this and kind of work through some of it, even while it was finalized and in production um, based on Table Talk, I, had, I went back and I adjusted. I made several adjustments uh, along the way. So I want to say thank you. From the bottom of my heart to everybody on this channel and in the chat for all of your contributions, whether it was just a comment or two in the chat or coming on to the channel and discussing things with me live and having a discourse with me, it uh, it has meant a lot and the book and ideas have improved as a result. Well, I thank you for doing this on this channel here. I think that as this goes, the Heroines Labyrinth is going to be very important and, and people are going to find a lot of value in the discussions that are here. We've been putting out uh, uh, clips and things like that, which I think are going to be found. We already have two people here. Let's let's do one thing first, Doug. Then we've got okay. two people to bring on. Let's give out the link that we got two links to give out. So if you're here, and then we'll start a discussion with the panelists. Okay. Um, so the first the first link. What? Well, hold on. Where's my uh, window that people will need? Oh, I got a million windows up, and I just lost it all. Oh, right here. Okay. So the first one uh, is the most important, which is where people can get it. So right now we're doing this online because this is released on March 26th, which is Tuesday. That's the, that's, right. that's the book in hand date. And actually James Bacon was saying that he's pre-ordered this book on Amazon and it's telling him that it will arrive on Tuesday. Now we now it's Amazon, but that's why we're doing this here virtually on Thursday, tonight, Thursday. So if you have not put in an order for the book yet, I'm going to put the link right here, uh, order right here, order, pre-order, pre-order Heroin's Labyrinth. We'll put this out a, a couple of times during the show. Pre-order Heroin's Labyrinth um, right there. And that means that, yes, right, you, I know you don't have it yet. And I think that uh, it was Druden Fuzz who said something about that. But <laughs> um, but but if you were having the launch party right now, because if you have not put in your order, then mm -hmm. it'll be in your hand, according to Amazon on launch day, which is Tuesday. So that is right. in the chat. Uh, but then also, Doug, you're doing a giveaway tonight. Yes. And Heath, I was thinking three. What do you oh, think? You want to give away three? Yeah, not okay. just one, but uh, I think three. I think, uh, like I said, I, I'm very grateful for the chat. And I know some of you live in Ohio and some of you live in Germany. It does not matter where you live. I will ship globally uh, just uh, as a show of total gratitude on my end. I'll sign it. Uh, I'll put a personalized message in there and I will send it directly to you. And Keith has set up a, uh, a system for this and uh, a, a random way to draw. Uh, the yeah, name. We will draw randomly at the end. Let me grab this uh, link right here. Okay. Right here. So if you want a free signed mm -hmm. copy, we'll, we'll put out this link occasionally through the, throughout the chat as well. Get a free signed copy. Just sign up there, put your first name, your email address. We'll use random.org at the end of this stream to give away three copies. We'll draw three people and we'll give away uh, three copies of the book. So those are two important links, the Heroin's Labyrinth, Amazon link, and a free uh, copy that's signed by Doug. So those are, the, those are the two links we got right now. All right, we got two guests already in the waiting in the wings. And these, awesome. are, two, these are two people who we have been trying to get together and we want to speak with one another. So we're kicking this off in like the most epic way possible. Chris Vogler and Cameron Pasha. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Welcome to you both. <laughs> oh, that is great. That's amazing. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for being here. 
Well, I wanted to say, first of all, congratulations, Douglas. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about it today, but it, I saw a very early version of this. He consulted with me through my Patreon on it, and I saw that there was something special and magical. I even tried to get him uh, a large publisher, uh, and but it, you know, he got it went out the way it's supposed to, and it's going to get out to everybody. It's great. And Mr. Vogler, it's such an honor to meet you because I've been a screenwriter for 23 years, uh, and I was teaching at Penn State screenwriting last year, and your book was our textbook. So oh. it's a very great honor. You know, you've been, uh, your influence is greater than I think you know. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, if you're there in the classroom in the trenches, then, uh, you know, your influence is great as well. Uh, but this is a, a really cool uh, occasion. Um, it's a very important moment when a book is launched into the world because this is something um, that has the potential to be timeless and to uh, thread its way into a web uh, or a weaving that uh, tapestry that uh, is, is already in flow. And, um, you know, this is what's exciting to me about the book itself uh, is, is the, uh, the way it picks up with this beautiful flow and um, articulates a, a lot of things that uh, it was just time. It was the right time, I think, for these things uh, to come along. And um, so congratulations, Douglas, uh, on, on seeing it through. You know, that's itself a big thing. To see anything through uh, to, to the end is a big matter. A big, well, big magic, you know. Well, thank you very much. Um, I mean, you guys know when you put the... It took closer to five years. I started this in 2019 and, you know, it's, it was just notes. So when, when someone like you says, you know, thank you for seeing it through or congratulations on seeing it through, that hits me because uh, for five years, this has been such a major project day in and day out. And, you know, some part of me can't believe that I'm not going to be working on this uh, feverishly, yeah. that I could do something else, <laughs> you know. Isn't uh, that yeah, isn't yeah, that well, interesting that that when you have a book in you, it's like there's an alarm bell going off all the time. I must do right. this. Somebody else will do it. Uh, I, I have to get there. Uh, I have to express myself. Uh, and then when it's out there, it's like, where's that alarm? Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and, and there is this energy that becomes available maybe to think about other things. But I just want to read you a quote. This is above my computer here. Uh, this is from Sir Francis Drake. Uh, he said, there must be a beginning of any great matter, but the continuing on to the end until it is thoroughly finished yields the true glory. So you've done uh -huh. that. You, you've you seen it through to, to the end and uh, a, a good a good end and a good beginning at the same time. Yeah. Well, thank you. That, that was a heck of a quote. And uh, I'm definitely feeling some of the weight of having completed a, a task. Like even now, it's starting to dawn on me. <laughs> you know, um, one of the things, because I was making last minute changes and getting new. I, you know, Barbie came out when I thought I had a, and I was like, oh my God, how can I exclude Barbie from this discussion? And, you know, so, but at some point I had to stop <laughs> and and move on. Um, and I even I have no people are still telling me about other things. So I'm like second edition. I'm, I'm just going to think about it and add it later. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, as we know, because as Mr. Vogler has, he has a very ex well expanded second edition. I don't know if there were mo I'm, there, I'm sure there were multiple editions, but the one uh, I used yeah, was more than the fourth, one I bought. Fourth round. Yeah, that's the third yeah, exactly. edition. And notice a labyrinth fourth on the round. cover. Oh, you're working on the fourth the edition. Well, no, that's the 25th anniversary edition, uh, right. which is actually technically the fourth. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that, what you said, adjustment. Yeah, there it is. Uh, Heath has a copy. Um, you keep adjusting. And this is wonderful because, you know, you, you don't know everything at, at a point in this stream of time. Uh, you're, you're picking up and learning uh, and moving along uh, all the time. That's, uh, that's one of the exciting aspects of it is that it doesn't die because you finish a version. Of it. Right. Yeah. Well, and even with, with your book, the changes that have come, sometimes you'll like um, summarize what's new uh, in the in the edition. And, you know, even even coming onto Table Talk, this channel, 
and discussing things with Cameron and James and Sable Phoenix and Heath and Brianna De Silva, um, you start to, it, it forces you to communicate in a different way. And it, it, it creates some clarity and some modifications and the idea grows and changes and evolves. So at some point you have to write a second edition because where you started isn't where you are in a couple of years thinking or discussing uh, these ideas. So, and I, and yeah, I, just I, I, to- I thought of it as a, a waveform that goes out and it meets the shore. It meets the rocks. It meets the opposition. It meets the, the <laughs> world as the world is changing. And then that ripples back to you. And then you have the chance to uh, restate it and uh, uh, clarify and, and uh, answer the, the reasonable objections. That's, that's yes. how it gets better. Um, yes. one, one big thing that has been rolling over me um, in the last few weeks after having encountered your book and talked about it uh, with uh, Heath and, and so forth. Um, and, and also I did a, a Zoom on the Academy Award winning film. So we talked about Barbie and uh, you know various uh, issues that pertain to this. Um, I had a feeling recently, very happy feeling of integration about the hero's journey and the heroine's journey. They never have really been in opposition to me, but I got a different sense that just arrived recently that they're really expressions of the same thing, the human journey, and that they're available to us in on both sides and that there's uh, a sense in which the hero's journey is not really uh, gender related at all. It's an, it's a version of, of what humans can do. Same thing with the heroine's journey. It, it, it has all these associations with the feminine, but it isn't necessarily only that. Um, totally and, correct. And, and, and that's just very exciting to me to feel the things. I really felt it internally that these things were coming together and integrating into one, you know, complete, more complete picture of, wow. of what it is to be human. Well, that's a heck of a thing to say. <laughs> um, and I agree with you. I, I agree that, and, and I, I tried to explain myself even in the book that I believe the heroine's labyrinth is um, feminine in its dynamism, and yet it transcends gender at the same time, the same yeah. way I feel about the hero's journey with masculinity um, and its ability to transcend. Uh, so uh, I feel I agree. I'm in agreement with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I did want to say, um, so like I said, I was, I was making adjustment after a, a, a deep discussion with Cameron uh, early, earlier in the production process, a lot of changes there. And uh, I thought the book was uh, essentially done, you know, and uh, we had uploaded it. Uh, it it's uploaded. It, it, it's final. And uh, after a discussion with uh, Mr. Vogler, uh, you had asked me some questions about the um, diagram that I had, uh, the the mm-hmm. maze with the with the uh, checkpoints, and I it did not sit. I did not feel comfortable with my answer, and it kind of bugged me. And I looked at it. I was like, "Man, this is more of a visual checklist, not exactly a, a functional diagram." So I <laughs> paid a little extra money to pull it out, <laughs> add a new diagram that I felt better reflected the journey of the heroine in, in a more dynamic, more accurate form. And we changed the book at the last minute, literally within the last six days uh, of the launch. And uh, we, we, she liked it so much, she moved it to the front of the book. And I was just going to share it with you because I'm very proud of it now. And uh, it feels wow. much more usable and visually uh, accurate. So let me. Um, can you get it? Can you do a share screen? Yeah, yeah let me yeah. do that. Oh man, that's great. Speaking of which, while we're going, Alan Burton, thank you very much for a $20 super chat. Says a brain trust collection online for sure. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Alan. <laughs> well, you know, this is a very special channel. While you're doing that, I mean, it's, Heath has created a special channel that's brought us all together. So let's take a look at this. Yeah. Oh, so man. This, this is, is it now. This is really good. It, I see where this is going. Yeah. It maintains the spiral, but it's a different type of spiral, it's more of a gal- galaxy spiral. What Mr. Yeah. Vogler had questioned me on was 
what is the meaning of your of your diagram? And the last one, if everyone remember, was a spiral inward, which I felt reflected the inward journey. But Mr. Vogler asked, he goes, what does it mean? Is she stuck in the labyrinth? Uh, does the labyrinth mm -hmm. dissolve once she reaches the center? What does it mean to end in the center? And I was like, actually, she shouldn't end in the center. She should end by leaving the maze. Uh, well, that's the point. That's the archetypal idea of the labyrinth. You got to get out, right? That's correct. The so I couldn't get it out of my mind, uh, the, the back and forth with Mr. Vogler. So I, I went back, I looked at various spirals, and I found one that did spiral in and also spiral out. It's also the symbol on Moana's uh, green koalu stone. Um, this one, and the odd thing is you see, it actually breaks up into a strata, act one, act wow. two, wow. act Look three. So I believe it's beautiful and it's oh. asymm it's symmetry. <laughs> well, this, so, is, this is just fantastic because um, I always had the feeling that... Um, part of the language that we were developing about storytelling mm -hmm. um, involved coming up with graphic representations of the major events in a story and how they relate to each other. And, uh, you know, we started with just a linear diagram, like a railroad track from town to town, which was the old three act structure, uh, Sid Fields uh, thing that he, pioneered and thank goodness that that he did uh and then Campbell's additional way or different way was to bend the same exact diagram around into a circle uh and then I uh, came in adapted that made it into four quarters and uh you know sort of uh systematized it in a different way um but the job wasn't done because I felt, you know, there were different geometries, like a triangular one we've talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in a lot of uh, classic stories. Um, and also I, I was aware, but it, it hadn't gone deep enough yet on um, spirals and other kinds of, of geometries or bullseye type uh, arrangements. Concentric uh, circles. Yeah. Where there are like quantum levels. And uh, you, you go from a fuzzy kind of external to going deeper and deeper to some core and then making your way back out again. But this combines all of that, mm -hmm. um, I, I think, very elegantly. And I think you're just at the beginning of extracting and mining out of that a lot of powerful, real stuff. That, that I think actually has corresponding um, mm -hmm. expressions in reality in people's lives. Uh, well, you know, I, in, bel in I believe that there's going to be a lot of changes because even in discussion, any discussion I have with people who think about these things, immediately it like meshes and you get you get this evolution. So, you know, and this is, we're, we're with a small, a, a huge group uh, of people and thinkers, um, but it's still a small sample relative to like Mr. Vogler, your your uh, interpretation of the hero's journey, which you know, you know I'm actually writing an article, which I'll I'll make a little announcement here in a second. But um, you know, I believe that your version of the hero's journey is really what people use and think of when they talk about the hero's journey. The mm -hmm. the more you really differentiate what you've done with what Campbell did, um, I really think people are using your hero's journey. Um, so, and, and that has evolved, you know, uh, as, yeah, needed, and, as we've gone. Yeah, it was actually uh, part of my intention. The original document behind the book, before the book, was the memo I wrote at Disney uh, mm -hmm. to explain Campbell back to the world of, of filmmaking. Um, the original pamphlet was called A Practical Guide to the Hero with a Thousand Faces because I wanted to make it practical, useful, a uh, hands-on thing. Um, hands have come up a couple of times already in this discussion. We talked about uh, hand selling, uh, that, that uh, your, the book will be in your hands. Um, <laughs> That's true. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, doing it the way you're doing it, giving away free copies, great idea. That's a form of hand selling. So um, 
you know, uh, it, 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 when you do a book, you're you're handing it off to somebody else, and they massage it and they make other things out of it. So uh, it's very exciting to to see this, to see this process continuing, which I have enjoyed all through my life tremendously. Uh, the feedback loop that you get into with people is is just thrilling. And and, 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 what, and what is the feedback loop, sir? The feedback loop is a spiral. So I, I want to actually. I actually want to, okay. if you can, can you bring that back up? Because I want to make a couple of comments. I can absolutely about, bring that back up. Here we so, go. Well, so I want to make two comments. One, uh, one about the universal nature of spiral in the natural world. And one yes. about the spiritual archetypal nature. So in the natural world, obviously, I mean, the most fundamental organizational thing we have is our galaxy. Right. And that's a spiral. Right. And, you know, you can think of our uh, planets uh, you know, revolving around the sun in a, in a spiral fashion, especially a Pluto, which has an asymmetrical uh, orbit. Uh, but now, and then, you know, we have whirlpools, and all these things. So it's a very creative uh, energy that seems to be a natural, uh, you know, structural design within the universe. So because of that, it also, as within, you know, as above, so below, right? As within, so without. Uh, so you've got the spiritual element of it. Uh, the spiral exists uh, throughout all these religious traditions, right? You know, I'm, I'm from the Islamic tradition. We circle the Kaaba at Mecca, right? Uh, in its in a spiral fashion, right? Uh, it is, you know, again that that also mimics the the revolution of the uh, of the uh, planets around the sun in a counterclockwise fashion. Uh, the rotation of the of the of the uh, galaxy around its center, uh, but also uh, it, within Buddhism, the spiral represents uh, essentially the journey to enlightenment. It's not a linear journey, right? Uh, and that you have to go through the journey, the Maya of the they have to go through the journey of illusion, which is the which is uh, you know which is the uh, the uh, the labyrinth. In fact, that's often used as, as a corner. So this idea of the spiral is archetypal. And the final thing I'll say about this is something I said to you very early on, which I think was a uh, was a. I think you had a lot of aha moments in this process. This is an aha moment based on some of the early designs you showed me, of uh, visuals you had for this. Um, look at the, what you finally drew here. Doesn't it look even more like the human brain now? The line you found. <laughs> yeah. like I told the brain and the, brain the yin and yang. Yin. And and, yeah, and again in the yin. These are these are yes. all universal symbols. As we so right. did so it's the Tao right there. Well, wow. yeah, the correlation between the idea of a labyrinth. I mean, I can just take Mr. Vogler's book mm -hmm. as a symbol of, of human psychology is perfect. So mm -hmm. I did. I went back in the book and I added that connection because I don't think it's uh accidental. I do think there's kind of an inner journey psychologically just as there is an inner journey in the real world so i thought that was and that a lot of that and cameron has continued to point that out like he was pointing uh, inside out which is a hero and centric story she literally is walking around in these giant mazes with these little you know memory balls that are all over the place and there's a scene where it zooms out and you could see the whole maze i was like oh my god that's exactly what Cameron was talking about. That that is the maze as the human mind. <laughs> it's Pac-Man. It's Pac-Man. Yeah, you know, from the <laughs> it's, it's Miss Pac-Man. I mean, this is this is this is Generation X was all about spirals, right? Generation X was all about that because we didn't have a linear existence, right? We were the Latsky kids, right? Latsky so we had to, kids. <laughs> we had to spiral through life, right? Yes. Yeah, and, and <laughs> it's, it's, it's you're absolutely right, uh, Cameron. Absolutely right that that spiral thing. Uh, goes uh, holographically through everything. Uh, it's in the way sunflowers, the the, the way the the, the oh, petals yeah. go. Uh, you know how how a rosebud undoes itself, opens itself up, uh, and so on. In the human body, the uh, fascia that they're just beginning to understand uh, wrap spirally around the limbs, and uh, you know it's just so fascinating how. Uh, knowledge, wisdom, and so forth is packed into, it's embedded into some of these things we're talking about, like basic geometric forms uh, of, of this kind. Um, I, I've gone back and done some yoga recently and um, find that when I go into the pose and I relax into it, there is a bag of knowledge at the end of the pose. Uh, mm -hmm. If I'm trying to reach my toes, you know, I don't strain, but I relax into it. 
And I find if I relax and breathe properly long enough, there's knowledge, there's a thought, there's a, a, an insight uh, that is connected to the physical shape you put yourself in. So uh, it's, it's really interesting to see uh, how, you know, you've, you've, you're planting seeds, Douglas, uh, <laughs> and, and you don't know what sort of things are, are going to uh, uh, unfold, manifest themselves from it. But uh, I, I think your intentions are very positive, and that has a lot to do with it. You could take knowledge like this and use it in a lot of different ways, but um, I, I have it pretty clear that you, you have uh, your heart in the right place about it. And, well, and so your intentions will carry it uh, to, uh, you know, uh, unknown but really good ends. Well, I, I like the sound of that. <laughs> um, yeah, my my goal, because I, you know, I had, you think about these things when you start a project like this, and my goal is to help other writers tell tell That's their right. stories and uh, and understand their stories in a way that was not quite available uh, to me. I found it while writing my my uh, debut novel, the uh, historical fiction novel, which was hero and centric, and I uh, the hero's journey helped me get started. And um, there's clear cut hero's journey moments in the story, but uh, about halfway through, it started to just stop working uh, completely. So I had all these notes and I started, started this project, you know, inadvertently just trying to solve my, my personal problem. And as this grew into a bigger and bigger and bigger idea, I was like, man, if this helped me, um, this has to be able to help other people write, write stories. Um, and you, I would read articles in a, a memoirist and they're like, I was trying to write my memoir and I'm so upset because the hero's journey didn't solve my memoir. And does it, and, and I felt um, actually bad because the woman who was writing it said, does that mean women don't have a boon to bring back? And I was like, no, that can't be your conclusion. <laughs> you know? So um, anyway, so my hope, my, my sincere hope is that this gives people another lens with which to look through and understand and craft stories. That's really what, what I want. <laughs> Well, I mean, on yeah. this idea of the boon, like if we think again about the masculine, the feminine, I mean, you know, going back to the Tao, right? Go ahead and going back to that. So within the feminine, we've talked about so many layers. Is within the feminine, you know, it is a the feminine is taking energy within, right? It's taking energy within, gestating it and bringing it back out in the form of life, right? Uh, we talk about, you know, the, the, the intestines, the human intestines are a spiral, right? You know, they're bringing it up, right? Uh, but but if we if we look at this, the I, you know, the ultimate boon, you know, is without women, there is no life, right? You know, <laughs> life, life cannot continue. Right, uh, and and it is about it is about going through the internal process, uh, and I even talked about the similarities of of the sperm and the egg, right? Going through the fallopian tubes, and that's that's a labyrinth, right? Uh, and so this this is why this is so pivotal, and I think that we needed both of these steps. I think we needed Mr. Vogler's masterful, uh, break, you know, introduction to the general public of these ideas and, and encapsulating them in a very unique way to start the first foundation of 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 the of the the yin. Right. And then the young had to come after that because then people had to process and say, this feels like that's only halfway there. Right. Of course, it's only halfway there because it's a world of duality. Right. And so the next stage had to be someone. And I guess the universe chose you, Douglas, because I didn't I, I've been writing female centric stories for years, but I never knew what I was doing. I just following an instinct. Right. You encapsulate what I've been doing. Right. And you made me know well, that's what I've been doing this whole time. Right. Someone had to do this and you were the one chosen to do it. And I again, I still don't know that you understand how seminal this work is going to be uh, over the course of, uh, of the next few years. I definitely do not. <laughs> um yeah, I, it, it is interesting, Mr. Vo thinking of it as some, you know, as ideas that grow, you know, I'm, I'm currently writing an article and, and part of it, I have to analyze and compare different models. And I realized while writing it, that Mr. Vogler had actually done uh, two things, uh, not just um, reinterpret or help understand or translate from the gods, <laughs> the, uh, the hero's journey. Um, uh, Mr. Vogler also made this accessible and understandable and usable and practical to writers. And I think that that is sometimes underestimated as part of the contribution mm -hmm. there, that there's these esoteric ideas that, like I said, when I read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, I was like, what? <laughs> I, I was like, oh, let me read this paragraph again and again and again. I, I don't know if I understand what Mr. Campbell said. You know what? Saying. Academics dislike that book because they think it's too accessible. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are. Yeah, that, that is an irony about it, isn't it? Yes. 
Yeah, I yeah, brought so, that up to hey, the hey, college, you know, and my, I, my advisor, advisor was very upset because no, that's not a, that's not a real credible you know scholarly <laughs> work because people can understand yeah, I'm, it. I'm uh, I'm down in the books as a non-academic popularizer of a non-academic popularizer. <laughs> oh, what a great label. <laughs> and you're the one changing the world, and that's why they resent. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, that practicality, so I important. think, was the – what's that, Heath? I, I say the communication of an idea is so important. I stressed that when I was yes. teaching, that it's not enough to just get to the idea. You can have an amazing idea, but if you can't communicate it to the world or the people who need it, the people who need the idea, then it doesn't matter you had the great idea. The communication, yes. the effective communication of an idea – to the people who need it is an incredibly important part of the development of an idea. To quote Cameron on his own Patreon, it's not the idea, it's the execution <laughs> of the idea. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, in, in things like uh, climate science, for instance, that, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of body of knowledge and so forth, but it must be put into terms that, uh, that a lot of people can get. Uh, well, one of my goals while writing it was to emulate the practical element to this and to not build a fence around it and make it so, you know, I wasn't, I didn't want to emulate Campbell in that sense. I didn't want, I wanted this to be something that's directly usable. I bolded certain sentences so that a writer could flip through it and, and scan and, and see things and trigger ideas. And, you know, I put the cards, like all of that was based around usability for writers. That was a big deal oh, to me because yeah. that, that's it why scores. your book works. It, it scores very well in, in my eyes that way. Uh, it just, you know, sort of uh, fell open. A, a, a lot of times reading scripts for the studios, you know, some scripts would be impenetrable and others would open up like uh, uh, like an orange into very nice little sections that you could consume. And your book has that, uh, that useful quality. Oh, you know, good. I want to uh, uh, just throw out that... Um, I think you have the pleasant surprise ahead of you of discovering that it does work. Uh, no surprise there. It, it is practical and realistic for writers, but the fun surprise is going to be all the other things that people uh, use it for, uh, that, that you, you'll find people will recognize themselves in it having nothing to do with writing uh, or a very small part of, of their business or their occupation, uh, their endeavor, whatever it is, uh, they will find, they'll make something out of it. They'll, they'll well, take you it. You know, what's interesting is, it their own. yes. In fact, when I was working and she'll, she's going to try to join us tonight. She's hosting a, um, guided meditation. Uh, but she's one of my best friends. Her name is Lucy Williams. Um, she was working with me on this and she said some of what you were just talking about, uh, Mr. Vogler, that she's like, you don't understand. This isn't about story. This is like a, like a woman can connect to this and understand this. And this is, and she really wanted me to write this as an existential discussion of womanhood. And I was like, I can't, I can't do that because that's not where I'm coming from. I think it's for someone else to do that part. But my job based on what I'm doing is, and I had to make that, I wrote an 80 thousand word manuscript and half of, and I didn't realize, but I was getting frustrated because I was trying to incorporate all these other ideas. Some things with feminism, critiques of the heroes. I was playing defense. I was, and I, I actually lost interest at one point. I was like, I don't even want to write this anymore. I was like, I can't, it, I, there's too many things to address. And uh, I decided to, to, the problem was that I wasn't being honest with myself that I, I like writing. I like star Wars. I like aliens and Ripley, you know, that's where my background started. You know, I like history. So I, I decided to get rid I, I there was 45,000 words addressing all of these other issues and 40,000 that was about writing. Once I just focused on writing, it was like the pale lifted. I was happy and I was able to get to the end. So I made the conscious decision that I will let others do other things with this. Um, if they see that, if this is useful in these other ways, uh, that's great. Um, that, but my singular goal was uh, for the writer. <laughs> well, you won't have to do anything. They they will take that ball and run with it uh, in surprising directions. I, I can pretty much guarantee that. And and you'll get a, a lifelong pleasure out of that, uh, of, of hmm. seeing the, the uh, surprising ways people put it to use. Well, yeah, that, and, and I would look forward to that. 
well, and it's what we talked about, Douglas, very early on when I first saw your first draft of this, right? And you, you said, hey, can you can, can, can we do a consult all this? And I got a lot of consults that, you know, they aren't ready. And I was like, what is this? This is magical. What is this, right? Uh, and But I was going through it and I said, one of the early comments I made to you is that, and it, it was reflected to what I was talking uh, to Mr. Vogler's book, which is that the, these journeys are meant to are mirrors of the human experience. When you read Mr. Vogler's book, you know, it's a psychological journey for yourself. I said that to my students at Penn State. I said, look at your lives. You have these figures. You've got the mentor figure. You've got the trickster figure. You've got all these figures in your life, right? You've been through these stages. So I said, storytelling is a reflection of the human journey. It's not the other way around. So of course, people are going to use, they've used Mr. Vogler's book for personal psychological analysis, and they're going to use your book. I think a lot of women are going to find this book allows them to say certain things about their inner experience that they didn't have an archetypal language for before. That's a huge development in psychological discussion. My my mother has already, it's always fun when people start using terms that you came up with. <laughs> um, yeah. Even my mom, she's like, uh, you know, that was a cult of deception. And I had, I was like, oh, I, I'm like, good. It's useful that she has this language to grab a hold of there to explain something that frustrated her in her, in her life. Uh, so anyway, I, I think that's what part of what you're referring to. And uh, I've seen little, little bits of it and it is, it is pleasurable. <laughs> yes. That was one of the contributions of Campbell in the first place was to mm -hmm. give good, catchy, sticky, memorable names to these universal experiences. Uh, it's, it's a tricky thing to give names to mm -hmm. the moving parts of your concept because, you know, the nature of words is that when you choose a word, you put a little fence around it and it excludes some other possibilities. It, yeah. it covers maybe, you know, maybe it's a nice, rich, juicy word that covers a, a lot of different things. It has a lot of associations, but you're somehow excluding other things, uh, other other options. But uh, you do the best you can to make a, an umbrella word that that uh, will contain all these other multitudes of, of thoughts. Uh, yeah, that, and that's the trick. A good job. You, I, I, I think that's, you know, again, uh, a, a big uh, a big help for people is is to just give the, the names of things. I mean, I, I think that's a lot of the impact of my book was that it brought up to consciousness in the form of these, you know, 12 little things and uh, a, a couple of other vocabulary things. Uh, it, it brought it up to consciousness and allowed a discourse to go on uh, about what do you think that is and, you know, how does it work in your story? So uh, you're, you're just adding to that uh, uh, rich source. Yeah, and when we're when we're on Heath's channel and we're discussing stories, you know Campbell's terms, your term, like there's so many terms you grab from just to uh, just to try to express what you're getting at story wise. So these terms are are important to have so that it gives you and encapsulates a big idea and lets you kind of grab a hold of it and then figure out how how you're going to use it. <laughs> yeah, everybody everybody develops their own uh, list or, or, or bag of, of tricks or words, ideas. Uh, a, a lot of uh, what I actually use in consulting on people's stories, working on my own, is uh, really nothing to do with mythology. It has more to do with uh, vaudeville, uh, more to do with the traditions of show business, more to do with uh, what goes on backstage. Um, you know, and uh, in, in dance and music and all these other disciplines, marching bands. I mean, I, I, I learned a lot from marching band. So, uh, you know, hmm. uh, it, it's, it's just wonderful to, uh, to, to gather these things. I, I, I feel like you, you probably are in this stage I went through of uh, feeling I, I have to go around and catch these ideas with a butterfly net, you know, or, or, fly paper or something and uh, because they are fleeting and uh, you know it, it, it part of the job is catching them and then another whole job which you've done very well is organizing them oh my god in yep. a way organizing just, yeah yeah that was that was one of the hardest ones because I would have like you said it's a butterfly you caught it you start writing it but it's in the wrong chapter and you don't realize that until you've gone I was like oh this really should be here this is where this discussion should take place. 
Um, and it's actually fun when you start to feel like you pulled the piece out and you put it in its right place. You know, you're like, oh, that is the right order for this chapter. Like that's, that's mm -hmm. now I've got it, you know? So there is, the organizing was uh, one of the hardest parts, but also it, it, it felt right when you got it, you know? <clears throat> and and uh, there's been, oh, go ahead, Heath. Oh, no, finish your point. Then I'll, I'll go to a super chat, which I think will take us into another topic. Okay. Well, I was going to say, uh, I have a, uh, a couple mini announcements. Um, it's at the early stage, but um, <clears throat> I was in v Brandeis University is working on something that they call the Heroines Project, the, the Heroines Journey Project. And it's an ongoing project. <clears throat> and they discuss, uh, obviously, Joseph Campbell. They have Christopher Vogler's model on there, Maureen Murdoch, Victoria Lynn Schmidt, and uh, a few other proposed uh, journeys. But it's, it's one of the most comprehensive sites uh, that I found that tried to break all this down. Um, they invited me to send a copy of the Heroes Labyrinth for, for their review and uh, asked me to write an article um, to contribute to this project, uh, which they would then publish uh, in this in this process. So <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, it's I finished my first draft and uh, she's on vacation right now, but uh, um, this would be a, a little foray into, into the university system where I, I'm sure it's gonna be tough <laughs> crowd waiting there. Um, but um, also <clears throat> another mini announcement, I don't know, uh, Professor Hannah B. Harvey, who did a great courses, uh, The Art of Storytelling from Parents to Professionals. I cite her in the book. Um, she really, her discussion on fairy tales and Little Red Riding Hood is what really helped me jar away from the hero's journey to, to try to see something completely independent, uh, standalone, um, starting with Little Red Riding Hood and her discussion. <clears throat> She's offered to do a um, a publication review. The name of the uh, 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 periodical is Storytelling Self and Society Journal, and she's going to read it and write it and and submit it uh, for publication. Um, apparently, this group is uh, takes storytelling pretty seriously and are looking for you know new ideas and then obviously rigorously test it. So a little nervous, <laughs> but also ready to to go for it there but i figured i'd announce that here because uh, i was pretty excited about that <laughs> fantastic that's fantastic not only popular but academic audience the yeah <laughs> uh, i missed this for sable for five dollars sable phoenix is sent in to chris's point i'd love to see these two energies of journey written up in an overview of yin yang integration the two complement each other i think that we need to do that doug a video that we need to do once I once I have the Heroines Labyrinth book and read it, because I've got the the Writer's Journey book and the Heroines Labyrinth, I think once I read the Heroines Labyrinth, we need to do a video that's based on the yin and the yang that shows exactly how the Writer's Journey, that the Hero's Journey, and the Heroines Labyrinth work together and are the yin and the yang. I think that could be an amazing video. I think we should. I, I think that. that's next. I think um, that's next. That's that's the next territory to to focus in and discuss the integration of these. I do discuss it briefly in the book. I call it the intersection of monomyths. For example, when the hero comes in and slays the dragon and there's the captive princess chained to the mountain, <clears throat> some people are like, well, the princess is in a very reductive role there. And they're right, she is. Uh, but I discuss it as she's in her captivity bargain, just getting started. He comes into her life in, the, in his supreme ordeal. You know, So there's an intersection of these, these discussions and my, my issue was when you say they lived happily ever after, you're just skipping over the rest of the heroine story there. So um, so I think those kinds of discussions to reconcile, you know, the, the heroine's traditional role or, you know, roles we may not have been as comfortable with in past stories, trying to zoom out and look at it as a stage in her journey um, and addressing that. You know, I, Heath and I had a great discussion of Star Wars. Heath pointed out that Luke Skywalker doesn't show up until minute 17 plus in the movie. And Star Wars is considered a classic hero's journey story. Cla like one of the classics. And uh, when I look at it now, I see that the first 17 minutes is right smack in Act 2, moving into Act 3 of a heroine's labyrinth story. We start with a heroine bro with the broken truth. She's departing the native culture. She's being pursued. And I even noticed that... Uh, <clears throat> the head of the Star Destroyer looks like a Minotaur's head. It's kind of funny to see the, uh, like some of the, so she ate, she entrusts the fragile power with R2D. So 17 minutes of Star Wars is a heroine's labyrinth story. And then we move to well, Luke and, and then we really stay on Luke. 
So there, there's and Vader, a lot of Vader, Vader is a Vader is a is a is a is a Minotaur figure as well because he's he's so half her. human. Half, yeah, to her, to half human, half uh, half machine. His mask, you know, is not is not is more skull like. It's not a human face. Um, but it's interesting that you brought this up because you know we know George Lucas uh, is actually very knowledgeable about mysticism, Eastern mysticism. He studied Taoism. He studied Islamic Sufism. Right? You know, there's a lot of Arabic in the Star Wars. Uh, he's very. I mean, there's a reason he went to 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 uh, Tunisia. Tatooine is a is a town in Tunisia. He knows these cultures, and uh, and so. Uh, the very, you know, when you do have, I hope I can participate in that conversation when you talk about uh, the yin and yang element, because the force is based on yin and yang. And what people don't recognize is that in in uh, in traditional Taoist uh, description of the light side and the dark side of the yin yang symbol, the dark side is actually feminine, right? Uh, oh. You know, it's it, and that doesn't have a moral judgment. But what it is is it's it's about energy coming in. And 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 uh, and then you have the light going out, right? So it, it's it's a you know, and both each has a side, an element of the other. But you know, that's that's a fascinating thing is the, the dark side, which is about emotion. Now, how Lucas translates it into Star Wars, the dark side is about is about emotion, right? One could right. argue that is a central defining element of the feminine energy yeah, and that of emotion of tapping into the universal energy and experiencing it. Whereas the Jedi uh, were trying to transcend emotion. The light side, right? They were, it was, so it's about a conflict between emotion and con uh, uh, consciousness. Emotion is the dark side. Consciousness is the light side. But consciousness without emotion leads you to be detached from reality, which is how the, the Jedi fall. They don't see what's happening around them because their intuition is off, because they're disconnected from the feminine side, because they're, they're afraid of their own dark side. And, you know, it's, it's, what, it's what Anakin says, which actually has truth. I do not fear the dark, you know? And you know, oh, yeah. it overwhelmed him, but he was trying to teach them something, which was the purpose of the chosen one, which is to balance them. Is I do not fear the dark. You're going to destroy yourselves because you fear the dark and you can't, you cannot coalesce these two energies of, of universal reality, right? And that comes back right to your to the purpose of the of the 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 that labyrinth. Yeah, I think that's excellent. And, and there's plenty, plenty, plenty of discussion there for examining both models and and I bet there's a lot of hidden truths in exploring that. We, we'd probably unearth some big ideas uh, just messing around with that, <laughs> you know. Okay, yeah, Cameron, let me I, ask you. yeah, I think you'll find wormholes uh, going through all this that connect up things in unexpected uh, ways. Uh, you'll find a lot of uh, mirror versions, you know, that uh, one's uh, down is the other's up and, and uh, vice versa. One's inner is the other's outer, and they'll 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 be discoveries like that. Uh, I, I've learned to to trust those sort of things. Uh, I just uh, had a a thought uh, before I go uh, about you mentioned playing defense, Douglas. <laughs> yeah. you, you were mentally playing defense, and I just want to you know uh, share uh, a certain empathy with that uh, that. You're aware you're treading in dangerous territory, and that there are lots of critics uh, with sharp weapons. And um, you know you're brave to go there at all. And and uh, so I, I give you a, a lot of uh, respect for that, and uh, just counsel you not to wear yourself out looking over your shoulder uh, at, at what, what they're going to say. It, it, it's there, it, you know, it's awareness of it is, uh, in, an important part of the composition process, but, um, uh, don't let them cramp your style, man. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> man, that might yeah. be the line I keep in my head whenever I'm down. <laughs> Well, I mean, but that's that's that I think is good advice for all authors. And I've got a couple of novels published, and you know, never, you know, I actually stopped reading my Amazon reviews. The vast majority of my Amazon reviews are very positive, right? For both my novels, right? But the one obnoxious jerk always stays with you, right? <laughs> and it hurts you, right? So I don't read them anymore because you know, ninety, you know, ninety aff affirmative, how wonderful this book is. This book changed my life. Don't outweigh that one person that says this thing's a piece of crap, right? <laughs> and that stays with you. So you just have to learn to bounce that off. Yeah, that negative energy somehow really works. <laughs> it gets right in there. <laughs> so, well, I'll tell you, I know, um, Mr. Bogo, that you might have to leave. What I wanted to do uh, live was read my acknowledgments because oh, a lot you of should definitely people, do that right now. Yeah, right, absolutely. a lot of the people that are in the acknowledgments are here or will be here. So, um, I just wanted to do that live um, before 
uh, everyone it. left. So, and it's brief, but you know, like acknowledgements are, but I wanted to read it. Anyway, this is how it is in the book. Acknowledgements. The Heroines Labyrinth would not have been possible without a bevy of heroines and heroes in my life. I want to thank my wife and mother, Crystal and Sharon Burton, for all their time, patience, and insight. My father, Alan Burton, for the hours of discussions talking about stories and meaning. My friend, Lucy Williams, for her creative genius and feminine perspective. And finally, Cameron Pasha for his time-honored wisdom, mentorship, and professional counsel. I'd also like to thank Jennifer Thompson and her whole team at Monkey See Media for their hard work in producing this book, Carolyn Leavitt for her professional feedback, Christopher Vogler for his veteran expertise and advice, and finally, Keith Robinson, Brianna Da Silva, James Bacon, and DeVay Brian Jackson, DBJ, for their early partnership in discussing and exploring the Heroines Labyrinth in depth. So, thank you. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> It's wonderful. That that's that's an amazing group of people that you. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. I think it's an awesome group of people. <laughs> so no, should, should and yeah, fine. like part of the, the cri- yeah part of the criteria was who was willing to engage with me because it's one thing you know sometimes it depends on who you're talking to They're like oh yeah that's cool or you know people who have engaged with me challenged me uh, and le- and has led to material changes where I'm thinking differently based on that discussion. So that was kind of the criteria for, for why I would include someone um, specifically in the acknowledgements. So anyway, thank well, you. I want to thank you especially because uh, this actually ends the the dark night of the soul for me because I helped another gentleman get his book published, uh, you know, and introduced him to my literary agent, got him a literary agent, uh, then wrote the entire, uh, for him, wrote wrote the pitch that got him to his publisher that sold the book. And then when the, I was going to come in as a ghostwriter and the publisher decided to kick me off as the ghostwriter. Fine, that happens. Uh, but but then when the book came out, I wasn't in the acknowledgements. I was like, dude, so you have oh, ended my dark night of the soul. You've taken me out of my labyrinth and brought me into the light. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, and by the way, we should also say the reason we are actually all here tonight is also because of Cameron, because it is Cameron who put oh, yeah. Doug in touch with me or me in touch with I forget exactly which direction it went, but that was early. That was about a year ago. So yep. it was Cameron who put us both in touch. So that's why everything that's happened on Table Talk has that's happened right. is because Cameron put us in touch. And then that's you correct. brought Christopher Vogler, and then who is we you know, an archetypal figure of archetypes. You brought you brought him into all of our lives, and that that's an incredible accomplishment. So, so so thank you. Yes, very much so. So anyway, I just wanted to um, to read that live. Uh, it, it, thank you for entertaining me on that, and uh, it means a lot to be able to say it live. Uh, well, well, guys, I, I'm going to uh, uh, take off now and okay. uh, just uh, wanted to give you my blessing for what it's worth. Uh, and uh, you, you appreciate, again, um, what you've done. It's a, quite an achievement. And um, I'm excited for you for what, what lies ahead, uh, that the uh, ripple effect of this is going to be uh, most impressive and uh, I, I just want you to have a big uh, kick out of it and uh, in, enjoy the ride. A, a book like this, as, as mine was, can be a magic carpet that will take you a lot of places. And uh, I, I do uh, anticipate you will enjoy that ride. So best of luck. Congratulations. All right. I got the link thank up. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very My much pleasure. for being here. Right. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. So long. Right. Good night, Mr. Vogler. <laughs> Man, that is great. I will never forget that advice. Yeah, this because, was uh, incredible. Because <laughs> the second the second you start to get frustrated or anything or feel cornered or caught off guard, he's just like, "Have fun with it." <laughs> Don't let it. So I, that is very good advice. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, and what what what, and, and he's also right about you know there will be naysayers because. Uh, things like this will trigger people. You know, there'll be yeah. people that come up and say, why are you as a man writing this? I think that would have been more relevant three years ago. Hopefully we're a little bit past that, I think in culture and society, yeah. but there, there will be some jackass, right? You know, you know, I, I had, you know, I had one person, uh, you know, cause my novel, Mother of the Believers of the Prophet Muhammad's wife, Aisha, right? Uh, when I got, when it first came out, you know, I had all kinds of reactions. People loved it. Some people, you know, some the more fanatical elements within my community were very angry without having read it. Uh, but one one review struck with me because I was just describing her as she was described in the accounts that we have of her, 
right? That she had red hair and, and light skin and all that. And when I, I talked about that, you know, a, a Muslim woman, uh, I guess an African Muslim woman, wrote a whole lengthy essay about on online about how my book was racist because I kept talking about the white skin. I was like, well, you know, it that's how she's... I mean, there were I mean, there were a lot of black people in the early Muslim movement, right? The first prayer caller was black African, right? Uh, and so wow. it just happened. That's how she's described. But again, that was a trigger for her. It was a trigger for her seeing a reference to white skin because she has her own issues about race, right? That was just a person. But that one hurt me because the person was accusing me of being a racist, right? So you never know what people's agendas are. But remember this. They're coming from within themselves. It's not about you. It's about themselves. And that's the way you detach if you start getting feedback that doesn't feel true to you or it's, that's hurtful doesn't feel true to you. I think that that that's a key. Yeah, that's a pivotal thing. It can be it can be hurtful, but it can be true and you have to listen to it. That's the absolutely distinction. Absolutely right. Now that I totally get what you're saying and uh feeling true, I think that's the key. I think that the I think the times when I I've been or and I'm sure you guys are all the same where when so you know, you're having a discourse and you you know the difference between a powerful challenge from someone who cares about the subject matter someone who's questioning you or challenging you or or coming at you from a new angle, that's totally different from that not ringing true, that other feeling like they're saying something that doesn't feel right, com like completely doesn't feel right. Well, or um, that the person doesn't understand. Well, but that's a different issue to me because right. I'm pretty patient and, and, you know, with others, you know, like we've all had people in our lives that we've tried to help or, you know, what. sometimes people don't understand and you have to be patient to try to explain that you know, to a point, you know, but um, but also, yeah, the, the, the zingers sometimes can get in there and, and rattle you a little bit. But I think that the main point, my main goal is to help other writers. And I think if it doesn't work for some people, then then that's fine, too. Um, as long as it works for anybody, if it works for one person, then I've met my goal with that one person, you know. So, so, so now I'm going to give you feedback on your cover because I'm looking at it on Amazon. because I just ordered your book. I just ordered your book. Right. Oh, right. awesome. So, so I don't know if that's the final cover because actually sometimes the, the one that Amazon puts up is not the final cover. I had that with my novels, right? But if that is, I would urge you to adjust it so that Mr. Vogler's endorsement of yours is on the top because you want to get the blurb in, on the cover page. And the specific blurb I would use looking at your Amazon page, you just need a couple of words. The people <clears> go, <throat> Christopher Vogler saw this, right? And all you have to say, it, it's Douglas Burton has cracked the code. That's it. And if you, you know, that should be on the top of your cover, you know, now, because people, Douglas Burton has cracked the code, quote, Christopher Vogler. And that way, when people see it, they immediately go, oh, this has been endorsed because not everyone's going to look inside the book and see the endorsement. So his his blurb is on the back cover right at the okay. top. But now, I would suggest has, that people, if this were in a bookstore and ultimately maybe, you know, because even something starts off in Amazon. You might get a uh, get, get a traditional publisher reaching out to you. It, ha it happens, right? It happens. And oh, so okay. in that aspect of the journey, if you want to get into a physical bookstore, <clears throat> right, uh, you should adjust that because my novels have, uh, have you know, they have a, a Amy Tan endorsed my first novel. So oh, you Stephen can imagine she just, you know, you know, it's even Pressfield endorsed my novel. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have, you have her thing right above the title. It's just a couple of words, epic and intimate. You know, hmm. a, you know okay. that's all I needed. And it was like Amy Tan, and they go, oh, I know Amy Tan. They picked it up. So just be aware of that part of marketing. Right now, it's coming on online, online, and so so that's fine. But I think this may evolve to a stage where the second or other editions will potentially be with a traditional publisher, and then you should be working with them on on because there's a different way marketing is done when you're looking at a book in the aisles. Okay, you may okay. have a second edition coming out in a month. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Listen, yeah, there's so much. There's so much that you could do. And <laughs> totally, like another movie came out, and another movie, and I'm like, oh my god! I'm like, it's weird though, because I'm also like, huh, I'm free. Like I could just watch the movie now. I don't. I don't have to think about it as much. Now I'll probably go back and and think about some of these movies again. But right now, it's nice to to like I'm watching Shogun, which is yeah. awesome. Oh, I love by it. the way, I love it. I I mean, it's, it's the best thing I've seen this year. I mean, it's incredible. Right. So there's a, there's a hero in Marika. Uh, 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 Mariko, 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 yes. Mariko. Fascinating character. And I'm and I'm watching her and I'm like, oh, my God, I, I want to study her because she talks about the eightfold fence. I don't know how far anyone's seen, but the idea of guarding the interior. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, But I'm like, OK, 
don't do that right now. <laughs> just watch. Well, exactly. Eight Ball Fence is a direct labyrinth reference, right? Totally. You, in order to cross from the the first layer of the fence, to you have to go through the twists and turns, right? And that's a and, and a woman has to say that. And again, people don't know. People don't know that they're doing this. They're just automatically <laughs> right. writing it without realizing they're doing the archetype because no one's pointed out the archetype before. Well, yeah, Cameron, I, I, I was I, this leads into the question that I was going to ask you yeah. because I was talking yeah. to Roz Morris, who is a, a author, but also has done tons of ghost writing and things like this. The other week, we were talking about uh, we we're talking about men writing women characters and and women yeah. writing men characters and back and forth. And I was thinking that I've got a, a, I know a few guys in my life, guys who are writing feminine protagonists. And of course, you're one of them. Doug's obviously one of them because he's got Theodora, yeah. but you're one of them as well. So I thought I would address this to you. I was like, what is the allure of writing the female protagonist? What has drawn you to that? And then what did did you decide like, or did you find later that you had some of the archetypes of Doug's book in, in them? Because we've talked about that Doug didn't develop this. He discovered it and, and yeah. you know, and codified it. But yes. like, why write feminine character? What's what characters what and protagonists really? What draws you to them? And how do you write their arcs? Uh, well, I, I've always been drawn. It's not just I have two novels. One is Mother of the Believers, which is the prophet's wife. The second is Shadow of the Swords, which is the Crusades. Uh, but it's told from the point of view of a Jewish woman that is a spy within uh, the Muslim army against Richard the Lionheart. So it's told from a woman's point of view primarily. Right. Uh, and then all of my major scripts that I have sold or uh, made throughout my life, the Taj Mahal epic, they're all about the women of the court. The current project I've been developing about the Ottoman harem. It's all about the women. So all my projects have been female oriented. Ninety five percent of them right so that's been my shtick uh and it's because women are frankly much more interesting to me because of you know i i wouldn't have used the word of the labyrinth but the labyrinthine but now as i realize the labyrinthine psychology the complexity the emotional complexity as a man uh you know i often like to joke and it's not totally false that you know women have many layers and complexity many layers of, of emotion and feeling and intuition and perception and most of us guys we're just kind of black and white we're like <laughs> our two emotions are we're either really angry we're just kind of fine, right? <laughs> those are those are our kind of two emotional. That's a kind of our range for most of us, I think, not for all of us. But you know, and so I'm probably a little bit with that binary guy in the sense that I'm I'm just kind of fine, or I'm full of rage. It's one of the two, right? Uh, and so, <laughs> so I was full of, yeah, I, mean, I was full of rage two days ago. I'm rage. fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine now. It's the range, right? And so so, but 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 women's layers are are they're eternal. They're infinite from my perception. And so exploring them is psychologically much more complex. And I'll give you just an example of a critique that I was given. Uh, and this is, we don't have to get too complex into Islamic theology, but it was a critique by by a woman that is a Shia. I'm a Sunni, which Sunni is a, sort of the largest branch of Islam, and the Shia is a smaller branch. And the, the Shia in particular focus on the prophet's family. Uh, all Muslims do, I do, but they they really elevate them in their tradition. And it's all, they, they really believe the leadership should only be in the prophet's family like a royalty. Okay, keep it simple as that. But because of that, you know, when this novel came out, a Shia woman critiqued me. Uh, to my face, we, we, I was, it was a book signing event, you'll have these, where people just come up to you and you think they're there to say something nice and to your face, they'll critique you. Right? So you gotta get ready for that, Douglas, right? So she critiqued me and she said, why are you writing about Aisha, who's a very complicated person, you know, the prophet's wife, she's, she makes a lot of mistakes, she ends up in her, after the prophet's death, her bad political angling leads to the first Islamic civil war and she loses, right? I mean, it's a very complex person, right? And she's like, why don't you do, why don't you uh, focus on one of the, the prophet's daughter, Fatima, who is a character in the novel? Why don't you focus on her or one of these other uh, holy women of the prophet's descent, right? And I said, the challenge is, and I had the challenge writing Fatima in the novel, is that in the Islamic tradition, they are seen as such elevated saintly figures we don't really have accounts of them making mistakes right mm -hmm. of 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 a of, uh, of failing of they are often the victims of other muslims mistreating them right but they are just holy maternal like virgin mary type figures especially the prophet's daughter fatima who is my ancestor and but aisha is a very very human person I mean, her primary attribute in the accounts that we have is full of jealousy. She was the prophet's closest wife, and she was also incredibly jealous that he had other wives, right? She would follow him around at night to see if he was going to go spend the night with one of his other wives. I mean, it's, it's a very human story, right? <laughs> and, so, and then, you know, after, and he, you know, and you know, she's full of anger, right? She's the only one that talks back to him. She'll yell at him in public, right? You know, it's a very complicated figure. And at the end, she makes disastrous mistakes that, led to the Sunni Shia split that led to Muslims killing each other that's been going on to this day, right? And she later acknowledged that she was wrong about all of it. 
I so that was like this person is so complicated. I mean, my anyone reads the forward of my of my novel, the opening, the opening chapter is Aisha telling the story on her deathbed to her nephew. And I just quote people, some Muslims criticize me. They're like, You're having her denigrate herself. So those are direct quotes. Those are direct quotes of her of her letters in the later part of her life, where she said, I wish I had been forgotten. I wish I had been a, a, a rock on the side of the road or or a or a, or a reed that was pulled up, that kind of thing. Because I led to so much death and suffering. Right, uh, because That's of my personal remorse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, she said I led to the the Islamic civil war that and the and it's never stopped, right? And I did that. And the prophet had warned her; he had seen a vision that she might be in a situation where she was going to bleed to all this bloodshed, and he had warned her, and she didn't listen, right? And so, mm. this is a complicated person. Her, her entire life is a labyrinth. <laughs> her whole life is there's so many, and she finally comes after all this crazy ups and downs and ins and outs. She comes out to the other side, and for me, what was most interesting is that when Muhammad dies, he basically has everybody else leave the room, and he spends his final moments in her lap and dies in her arms, knowing fully well that there's this complicated woman that he could see could pro is probably going to lead to a civil war, and yet he loves her the most because she's fully human. She's fully human, like he is, right? She's and he loves that humanity. Right. And so uh, that's why I loved her. I was like, that's, and so that's a long answer to this thing of women are complex. And I love the complexity. And there's no end. It's, you know, it's, it's like when it, Mr. Vogler said the idea of the, of the, of the, uh, the singularity of the black hole, you know, that because we've got the accretion disk of a black hole, which spirals, right? Mm -hmm. Like a labyrinth. And, and think about that. What is the accretion disk? When you enter the accretion disk of a black, a black hole, time changes, time slows down. Right. Yeah. You essentially start entering Einsteinian physics. Right. Where where you are, you know, you cut if you come out of there, 700 years have gone by in the two seconds you were inside the accretion disk. Right. And and then ultimately it where does the accretion disk lead to the where does that labyrinth lead to? It spirals down into the singularity, which is infinity, which is the creation of a new universe beyond that potentially. Right. And so that's the feminine soul to me. That's a lot more interesting than a dude who's like, I'm really angry or I'm kind of <laughs> good with my buddies. I mean, I, I don't have weird. I don't have a lot to go with that, right? And so that's yeah. why I write these characters. <laughs> yeah. Well, rage has its place, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, that, that's but a, women's that's rage a is far more dangerous. Women's rage is far more dangerous, as I showed in my novel. The reason I took launches a civil war thirty years after the prophet died is she couldn't forgive one guy, and she held yeah. a grudge against him for thirty years, right? So women's yeah. rage is dangerous. Yeah, there was a, a line in Dangerous Liaisons I, I never forget. She's like, when one woman strikes at another, she never misses. <laughs> I was like, oh, what a great line. <laughs> you know? Let me, so we are we're actually we're a little bit past the hour here. We have another uh, guest coming on. Let me, uh, since we're, if you're here and you don't know what was, what's going on, because some people don't, because I just noticed, okay, so wait a minute. Oh, well, here's, where's my, here we go. So like uh, uh, Swartz, AJ for $5 said, what's the book? I've got a story with a female main character that I could really use help on. Mm. And then Schwartz also says, I'm so glad I clicked on the URL that Pasha posted on his Patreon. Wow. I've been struggling wonderful. with my heroin and I just joined roughly 10 minutes in. Well, the book that we are talking about is The Heroin's Labyrinth. This is Doug's book. It is launching now. This is our virtual launch party if you are here. And so let me uh, grab... Uh, the the link I was about to put that in here. So if you would like to get it, it's it's going to be physically available on Tuesday, and of course that's why we're doing. So that was going to be a physical launch party on Tuesday, but we're doing a virtual launch party right now, according to Amazon. That if you order it today, then it will actually be in your hand, according to Amazon. Don't hold us to don't hold us to it. There's a little bit of wiggle room. We it's Amazon. But Amazon not is saying <laughs> that if you order it right now that it will be delivered on Tuesday, which will be its physical launch day, which is why we're doing this right now. So right here, we've got uh, Get Doug's Book, The Heroine's Labyrinth on Amazon right there. And then also, if you would like to get a free copy, then here, Doug is giving away free copies right here, Doug's Heroine's Labyrinth signed book giveaway. I'm going to put the link right here. Um, I guess this is the link I need. I'm going to put that out. So uh, get a signed copy of the Heroine's Labyrinth. Uh, we will we will draw three copies. Doug said that he would draw uh, sign three copies. Right, with a personal message. And I would love nothing more than to send these out. <laughs> and we'll draw for that randomly at the end of the stream here in about a little bit less than two hours. But so those are two important links. So if you're wondering what's going on, 
get the book on Amazon and it'll be in your hand on Tuesday for the physical launch. And then also we will be drawing for a free signed copy. Uh, Cameron, have you ever met uh, Retro Nerd Girl? I've had interactions with Retro Nerd Girl. Um, it's definitely in the chats. And I think, I, I think I've been on channel with her. I think so. Here she is. <laughs> Retro, <laughs> what's up? Retro, what's up? Retro, what's up? I've been on screen. We've been on screen yes. together. I know we've chatted in the chats. Okay. I know you've done that. Yeah, I think I think we've talked. Uh, I think twice now. So okay, I'm a simple guy without all these layers of liberty. The labyrinth of memory. I don't have it. It's black and white. <laughs> I, I, I'm I am guilty as well. <laughs> so Retro is here. She is a channel favorite. I'm seeing everybody saying hi to her as hi, we are going here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Retro has been on the channel quite a few times talking with Doug and me about story. She is a YouTuber. Here is her YouTube channel right here. I'll post a link in the channel right here. She's Thank always you. talking about stories. And always like reviewing movies, doing watch parties, but also doing movie reviews. Uh, uh, just uh, tons of material over here on her channel. So be sure you are subscribed to Retro. Oh, Nerd thank Girl. you guys. You're so kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Retro is steeped in her movie lore. So if you know. click on one of her videos, you are going to go into that rabbit hole with her. And it's, <laughs> it's a good deep dive. It's awesome. Oh my goodness, guys, you're making me blush. Well, I just wanted to say, first of all, congratulations on um, completing this book. And I, I believe this is a, a total game changer. Um, and it, it's it's wonderful. I, I'm, I think I'm inspired to, to do some writing now. <laughs> oh, awesome. That's the purpose. That's great. <laughs> Uh, we've got Echoes of Atlantis for $5. Thank you very much. It says, congratulations, awesome. Doug. I just wow. ordered my copy on Amazon. I'm looking forward to using your book while writing my novel. Awesome. I hope it helps. I give a bunch of examples in there just to, I know how writers think. So you hear a few examples here, two, three, four examples, and your mind starts to work. It, start, it starts to percolate. So the book is specifically designed to get writers moving with their with their stories if they're stuck so <laughs> schwartz asked already purchased or it says already purchased was felt it was the right thing to do it so, was the right thing to do it was the, <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much schwartz. it was a moral the, stance <laughs> the, uh actually doug this is a great question do you want to answer this is there a meeting in real life uh for the book launch yes yes there is so um, it's going to take place on March 26th, which is the official launch date, uh, which is also my dad's birthday. And um, yeah, it's it's oh, perfect. And my dad will be coming okay. into town. My mom will be here. Um, and a, a little secret, I uh, or not a secret, but an announcement, I guess. Um, I'm having Heath come out uh, for the book launch as well. I'm going to be there too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. For all, and, and let that me is tell awesome. You, Heath Wait, so where, where are you guys going to be? What, what city are you in? Where are you going to be? Austin. Austin, Texas. Oh, okay. I, yeah. Oh, so you're going to get to see the eclipse, by the way. You're going to see the eclipse. Yeah. Well, maybe. Because it, it's, I think, a week later. Okay. So, and, like, and, and Cameron, I know your schedule is going to be crazy and who knows. But well, what's, what's, the is, be a, what's the date again? What's the date? What's the date? March 26th. Tuesday. This is Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, oh, I'm wow. traveling to Pennsylvania with my mom on Tuesday, so I cannot necessarily. Okay. Okay. Well, and again, I know this is a long shot, but I'll be in San Diego on April 6th. Um, I've been invited to speak at the San Diego Writers Festival. It's on Coronado Island, and I'm going to be teaching the Heroine's Labyrinth. Uh, it'll be the first time I do it live. Yeah. We're where people could throw tomatoes at you. <laughs> I, I I would because I have friends in San Diego. I go there all the time. It's it's a, it's an easy two two hour and a half hour drive, and it's lovely. Uh, I would except I'm still in Pennsylvania until April 10th. So had I known, I would have. I just booked that ticket yesterday. Had I known, I would have scheduled around it. So forgive me, I didn't. Oh. Know but it would have been an easy drive for me to go down to 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 to, to there, and I would have come. So. Oh, that would have been awesome. Well, well, there'll be some. There'll what be about retro? Time. You got to fly out retro nerd girl. What are you talking to me about? Sure, sure. <laughs> we had talked about. Uh, well, this was a last minute decision. Writers, we're going to have to have table talk meetups eventually. I mean, we're going to have to have whole table talk meetups. Well, this oh, was something I decided nice. yesterday. The ticket was bought yesterday, uh, and it was just a way of me saying thank you to Heath. Heath is 
Thank he you. Has Thank you, Doug. Shared his channel with me with a level of generosity that is just very uncommon. And um, it got to the point where it just didn't feel right that he he wasn't here. So um and uh, Sable Phoenix will be there. We'll be there as well. Um, Sable! He, he lives in the area now, so that'll be cool. So we'll have a cool shot. Wait, Sable Phoenix is a guy? Sable Phoenix is a guy? Yeah. Sable Phoenix is a guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's news to me. <laughs> oh, <where's laughs> the girl? Interesting. <laughs> Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Yes. 2024, it's all good, man. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm gonna be crashing. I'm gonna be crashing with Sable Phoenix Tuesday night. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a quick hit. It's like in and then out. So oh. um we just had another guest pop in. Ooh. We did. So let's say Yay. hi, everyone, to Lucy Williams. Yeah! Yes. What's up? That is awesome. <laughs> it's good to meet you, Lucy. Thank you very That's much for being you. on my show. Thanks for having such a great show. I'm I love it. I'm impressed. I love that you love what Doug's doing. It's, it's all good. So, Lucy, this is Lucy's introduction to the channel. I know um, Lucy's never been on yeah. uh, on the channel before. So, so I guess yeah. I will introduce her. Um, okay, go for it. Lucy is one of my best friends in the world and one of my most, like, a confidant, a creative confidant. And, uh, can't, I mean, everyone who's creative knows you You don't just throw your ideas in front of anybody or, or you know, you, there's got to be trust. You know, there's got to be a trust there when you're bouncing mm -hmm. ideas off. Uh, and I, I've known Lucy since 1996, a uh, long time. And uh, Lucy is a musician and an incredible, an incredible musician at that. She was a keyboardist for the band Moby. And Yay. she was also in the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Um, so she she is an amazing creative individual. And she actually wrote a book, too, which is uh, called The Twelve Initiations of Mary Magdalene. So oh, wow. I'm on Amazon looking at it right now because yes. I'm absolutely fascinated, obsessed with Mary oh my Magdalene God. because I've been working on a, a novel about the women around Jesus right now. And so uh, – and so we'll oh, right. I want to know about this, yes. Cameron, that you will love so this book. Cool. Yes. What's the name of the book? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Twelve Initiations of Mary Magdalene. It's written as like a guided meditation. Well, Lucy, do you want to explain it? Yeah, yeah. Lisa. Yeah, like many shamanic journeys. Basically, she's the voice and she guides you through these experiences to expand your understanding of self, which is kind of how mm -hmm. I describe it. But that can that can be like going through a cave and facing a fear or remembering a past, you know, emotion then then letting it go. And they take place Sounds like a labyrinth. Sounds like a, a labyrinth. labyrinth. <laughs> Number, chapter five is a labyrinth. So there's yes. all these different scenarios. <laughs> Doug liked that one especially. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah you I literally go through a guided meditation where you you're, you're, there's a, a feminine um, being that leads you into the labyrinth and the guided meditation. You go through so the labyrinth. Is, this and is you like go magical up. path working with Mary Magdalene. That's what this is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well said. It's awesome. So, and uh, if you read the back of the book, you'll actually read Doug's writing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh wow. Doug's on the back of the book. That's right, yeah. <laughs> How impossible is that to write? You have to hire a brilliant human being. And I was lucky enough to receive Doug's words of wisdom on the back. <laughs> oh, man. Yes. Nobody knows yeah. that, but you. Yes. So keep it a secret on table talk here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Lucy. So it's, so I've known her for a good long time and we've worked on many, you know, projects back and forth together, but, uh, and, and Lucy was very essential to far away bird. Um, she gave me critical feedback that you can only get from, you know, a, a person that you trust that well. Um, and she she led to a major change, which ended up being one of my favorite parts of the entire book. Uh, I She questioned one part of it. I decided to ditch it and go this other route. And then this other route blew up into my favorite part. So it was awesome. It was all because of Lucy. Um, but what Lucy was instrumental with the Heroine's Labyrinth. We started talking about it back in 2019. And uh, I started breaking down some of the ideas, very, very rudimentary ideas. And Lucy was responding so strongly to them. And um, if this is what made me think, like, maybe there's something here more than uh, my mm -hmm. notes. Maybe it's more than just notes. And um, she was one of the most engaging, important individuals, I would say, for the first couple of years, at least, um, in getting these ideas defined, articulated and off the ground uh, in a way that made sense. 
So anyway, you're in the acknowledgments. I read the acknowledgments earlier. So it means a lot to me that you're here right now. Um, so sorry. anyway, thank you. I get to say it in, in, in digital person. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's because I'm a girl. Maybe you, retro nerd girl, <laughs> might understand. <laughs> when I read the draft, my body was experiencing things. And what I realized was I was going through things I've gone through over and over in my own life, living the heroine's labyrinth. But mm -hmm. it was physical. And I was like, Doug, do you feel this part? And he <laughs> felt it in a different way, right? I think- I, I We don't, don't feel say. nothing. I told you, we got two emotions. <laughs> and we were fine. We don't the feel anything. Pain. That's the only thing we feel. <laughs> That's we nice. Just had... <laughs> oh man! We just had another very intuitive. He, he's, he's, in. he's he's not just intellectual. He's got a super powerful, actually, intuitive side. So he he knows what uh, he collects tarot decks. By the way, it was Lucy that and also I'm helped. Telling him he needs to make a tarot deck from this book. It will sell. There, it will sell well. I'll buy it. Right? Yeah, I I love tarot. Oh, Wait, oh, Lucy, I've been, I yeah, I've been doing tarot since I was nineteen. So really, yeah, oh yeah. Oh, you have? Yeah, I I used to actually have a channel and. I, I ditched it so I could be full on uh, retro nerd girl all the time. But, oh, awesome. but yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you were a retro tarot. tarot girl for a while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so and here's I, my I saw... favorite. I've got hundreds of tarot decks. Oh, wow. you can't find anymore. The vampires, the tarot, the eternal Ooh. night. It's not easy to find. It's like it's like if you go to Amazon, it's like five hundred bucks now. If you can get it, it's really hard. I don't know why, it, but maybe because it's incredible. I'm going to show just a couple of these, and I'm trying to get Doug to make these. So look, here, here's an example. Like this is yes, you should. Doug. This is the vampire version of the fool, right? I mean, wow. it's just stunning. You have you've got you know the emperor, right? Mm, nice. Oh got, yeah. You got you know the high priestess, right? And uh, mm -hmm. where's 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 my favorite? Where's my favorite? Is oh, okay. So here you go. Okay, here this is great. You got the lovers, right? Cool. I mean, this wow. is nice. so, so yeah. And so so Doug has all these incredible imagery throughout the book. It is an mm -hmm. it is an obvious tarot deck. Yes. Well, it's so I made a decision not to do it yet. My intention is to do it um, back in twenty twenty when I published with with Faraway Bird. I had it felt like intimate or uh, intimate infinite. Funds. It felt like I was able to do whatever I wanted. Uh, this time around, it is not the case. So I have to kind of stage it out. But um, I've, I've actually spoken with Lucy about um, designing the deck. I created an Excel sheet where I made up all the suits and what the meanings are in a general sense. And I tied it specifically to the discussions inside the book, inside the Heroine's Labyrinth. So I tried to pull more story elements out and put them into the tarot deck because uh, that's what it is. You're you're interpreting archetypal images. You're telling a story. You're arranging these ideas. So it, that's why it was important to continue to keep the the story archetypes into the tarot deck because that would be the most useful way. So I've talked. I've spoken with Lucy about it. She was going to help spearhead the because um, it's not like you just throw a deck out there. You got to have the book that tells you what everything means. Yeah. So well, here's, here's another here's book. Lisa. This isn't yeah. a tarot book. This is this is the most. I just got this last week. This is actually new. It's not tarot, but it's a it's a whole it's a new special deck to do the I Ching, right? Mm -hmm. and, oh, but it, oh, it's wow. the first time yeah. that I Ching deck has been created where it actually has you know what you do is you do you draw two of these and you create the 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 the, the six tri the trigrams together, right? And I already just experimented with it. it's incredibly accurate and it comes with a very lovely experiment you know explanational book, right? Which you need to have. Right. Right. And that that book is the crux of the deck. Like the deck is obviously a work of art. You know, it's meant to be a work of art in and of itself. But how you use the deck is really, really important. And uh, um, Lucy, we brought you on to ambush you to make sure that you write this book. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'm so excited no, no. about it. I'm in. No, no, no. no, no. Wait, I'm so it's going to be flipped. It. He he wrote the back of your book and you took credit for it. Then you're going to write his tarot book and you're like, he's going to take credit for it. <laughs> it's balance. <laughs> balance. We have a new guest who has shown up backstage. So I want to bring him on. 
everyone, if awesome. you are have not met him before, this is DBJ. And of yeah. course, we have him on table talk before, but DBJ is here. Welcome. So <laughs> let me show you. If you don't know, I'll put the link to DBJ's YouTube channel uh, in the chat. And of course, this is RPG, but his YouTube channel is RPG with DBJ. So wow. please go watch not only my uh, our interview and our discussion, which was fantastic, everyone loved that, which is here on this channel, but then also DBJ is doing all kinds of stuff over on his channel. And it's really fantastic to have DBJ here because DBJ, you are a, a, a anchor in the Heroin's Labyrinth because he's the first person off of Table Talk to be talking about the Heroin's Labyrinth. I, I looked up the Heroin's Labyrinth I like, and I was like, Look, it's and then then your stream came up, and I, I sent that to that. Doug. I was like, "Wait a minute, look, DBJ." But we also had the connection <laughs> because you work on Mark Tasson's RPGs, and so we have those connections. So, welcome, DBJ. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> so, um, I, I hope I can offer my insight from this corner of uh, of the interwebs, um, <laughs> particularly from the point of view of role playing games, and. Uh, far more now than than ever before, uh, the um, the tabletop role playing community has really it's like a gravity of artistic uh, individuals and uh, tabletop role playing games are um, are intrinsic to the artistic community because it is first draft. Um, real life immediacy in the creation of text and direction and um, acting and um, <laughs> artistry and creativity on the fly. It's, it's improv at its best mm -hmm. with rules. And so um, some of the greatest uh, live streamers are making millions of dollars and extremely popular, a critical role being uh, the pinnacle of this. And these are voice actors and creatives of many types, and I, because it draws so many uh, artists in, um, the hero's journey, of course, is a uh, very, very uh, popular, and it's used as a framework even in tabletop role playing games. And I always thought that it was kind of limiting because I wanted to tell other stories around a g gaming table in the creative space, and I and I found um, Heath yourself talking with Doug about the heroine's labyrinth. And it just, it, I don't know, it took, I don't know, two minutes for it to click in my head. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, okay. So then I so then I used that to, to my live stream was translating that into a tabletop role-playing experience. And um, it really filled in the, the gaps, like taking a, a bucket with large stones and you can always fill it with more because you get smaller and smaller stones and sand and it fills in the spaces. And it just, to me, it just, um, uh, it just embraced the, the idea of storytelling. And it, it felt like the other side of the coin of the, the, the journey and then their journey back home. And to me, it filled the, the role of, well, what story do we tell after the individual who's traveled outwards comes back home mm -hmm. and comes back home to this, to have to navigate the labyrinth of the, the, the social structure of where they're at, or maybe it's physically transformed when they come back home and that sort of thing. So yes, very much so. I was very, well, and he and I have talked to um, a, a new idea. We talked about like Star Trek, for example, you know, Star Trek one, you know, the whole series, Kirk goes on a five-year mission with the enterprise. Star Trek One, there's this you know alien coming to destroy Earth, and he goes out to confront it. But as the story continues, Star Trek One, Star Trek Three, Star Trek Four, he's more and more at odds with his native culture. So um, Heath and I have been have been kind of batting around the idea that the longer a story goes, the more likely you might end up in a labyrinth-like situation. We've even noticed, you know, comic books. You know, you might have a great origin story that's a hero's journey. But then suddenly you're stuck in Metropolis and all your drama happens there or you're in Gotham City and there's another masked uh, villain, you know, hidden. And, you know, so uh, we we agree that it seems like there might be uh, another way to look at this as a hero's journey inception story and then a continuation as you become as you start to grapple with your native culture um, at whatever level you get to. 
you know, it doesn't matter how high you climb. In fact, it seems like the higher you climb, the more um, intricate the game gets <laughs> with the native culture. Um, you know, so uh, we we've we've had a similar thought. I have to say, the one thing about DBJ, there was something very specific um, about DBJ that I'll get to in a second. But I, I remember I found him online. I think Keith actually might have said, hey, hey do you know? Um, I think I was just stuff? Googling the Heroine's Labyrinth, and I was like, wait a minute, look. <laughs> yeah, so else I click on it. it. And so, so there's he, a, there's he was a guy about Heroine's Labyrinth before that, and then he's your first off-table talk interview. So Yes. So, well, the, it was weird for me because – these ideas are are in a very small knit group. And here I am watching a video and, and the, the gentleman on there is talking all about, he's like, this is the poisoned apple. And here's how, and I'm like, what? It was like, he was teaching the class. I was like, who is this guy? I go, I gotta, I gotta reach out to him. I have to talk with him. And, and the, and the live action was even better. DBJ had a, an incredible ability to intuitively understand things like immediately like he would take it and run with it and i was like man he, he could just sit here and teach half of the uh half of the course like with without even uh re reading the book or without having a like i never talked to him. so it, it was a thrill we talked for well over four hours uh on that stream and it was just a blast <laughs> yeah I, I i enjoyed it so much and um i i guess in in some way um you're like you're like my son zoo where maybe there were many military commanders throughout history, but you were able to bring them together, write you know, write them down and consolidate them into a, a into a um, a framework that the rest of us go, oh yes, that is it. That you know, that is the story. And um, uh, in many hero stories, uh, we often see our male hero leave and they leave their uh, loved one behind. And the secondary story is often told with the loved one left home, um, like the movie Three Hundred. We yes, see I was Lena thinking Hedy's about character that today. Home. Yes, and it's like, th of course, that's the, her story. Of course, it is, and it just it yeah, for, Queen for me, it just, line. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, it just it makes so much sense now. And I, I, I dare say, and this is a, a prediction of mine, both um, wonderful and, and a little bit dark. <laughs> that um, in Hollywood, we know that uh, when it comes to script writing, they have it broken down to to like how many minutes per page is written and think and and when a, a particular event should happen somewhere along the page count. And I'm imagining your your um, uh, uh, dissertation on this may become a staple in the uh, script writing community, as in this is when these particular events will happen at a particular time. Now, when I reason I say wonderful and a little bit dark is because we, we know that we've seen the horror of scripts written to a time length and very predictable and such. Overly but formulaic. I, right. But having having a framework to work off, like we all know, you, you we really need to learn the rules first before we break them. And so I'm, I'm very happy that this exists. So. So yeah, glad well, awesome. I'm glad you're here too, and I get to say thank you, um, face to face, you know, YouTube style. <laughs> so yeah, but I, I really appreciated that discussion um, because it, you know there's one way to talk about it and introduce the ideas. It was quite a different thing to have a back and forth immediately about like immediate practical application of, of the ideas, like off the cuff, almost like you said, almost like improving. So it was a very special conversation, and that's why you were in the acknowledgments as well. It was um, a, a very important discussion, and it's why I went back and added. So I said, this is a book for screenwriters, novelists, memoirists, uh, and I added uh, role players because I think it's been underappreciated probably for decades. The level of storytelling knowledge and ability mm -hmm. that is in the role-playing community, um, I, I've credited it many times myself. Uh, for making me a better writer, uh, just role playing. You have to think quickly. So when you, if you're in that mode and you're writing dialogue, suddenly it, it just all starts to auto populate, and um, that came from role playing. So um, if you're if you're stuck in a story, try role playing. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. So like, this is like uh, the Brady Bunch, like 
Uh, <laughs> like this is the most people have ever been on a table talk stream before. So this is amazing. Oh, oh Robert, Robert, see Robert Romano just sent in a super chat that says for four ninety nine. Thank you very much, Robert. Says congrats. My heroine, uh, my heroine always lost her sacred fire and is in a maze. Can't wait to see what other parts of the labyrinth were in the recesses of our of my mind. Which is not our theory with the heroine sacred fire. I will tell you that that. Uh, Moana is a great example of where a heroine, her sacred fire was stolen by Maui, Maui and she became Teka. And you'll notice it's a spiral symbol. And at the end, when Moana returns it, she's able to return back. But um, okay. a heroine but, sacred fire is is not to be lost or, or uh, stolen. You don't mess with yeah. that. Lucy, uh, we, I want to ask you. This is just too. You're, we're going to have to come back on this show. We, I want to have yes. you on for a, <laughs> oh a dedicated God, interview. You may be muted. Are you muted? Oh, um, Lucy, you're muted. I was yeah, muted. Lucy, Thanks, oh, guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I want to have you back because this just seems like your life story is just too amazing to not have as a dedicated table talk guest. Cool. Tell me about. Can you tell me about keyboarding with Moby? Like, I mean, this is <laughs> oh, like. <wow. laughs> like uh what do you want to know about that <laughs> it was cool i got paid to travel the whole world play some keyboards um i wasn't admitting that i was doing anything important i i couldn't believe people asked me for an autograph the first time they did i was like what are you talking about that's moby i am not and it didn't like click in until literally years later that like i was only one of five people on the stage <laughs> but i've just played piano since i was four so it was just kind of like Oh yeah, okay, we can do this. It was beautiful. It was amazing. And then you did the Trans Siberian Orchestra. Yeah, that's... that was that was more um, technically challenging. There were three keyboards and many cues and many complicated classical stuff. <laughs> that's <laughs> pretty was... impressive. <laughs> it's a legit band. We would show up after a whole. You know, it's only at Christmas, so we'd all be off, and then we'd show up in October to do rehearsals, and nobody had seen each other. And then we just say, "All right, let's play this first song," and boom, it was just tight and awesome. <laughs> really good musicians. Really fun. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, Lucy will, will is who. Come... Taught... Go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Lucy, who's taught me that, um, you know, although there might be different forms of art, it's like the same spirit underneath the hood you know if you're a musician or a painter or a writer or a gamer like it, there's the same spirit under the hood it's just different forms of expression so uh role playing it, it was, like come on like how deep i lived my life role playing i didn't it wasn't a thing when i was little that i could that i knew of i wish i was little now i would have rocked that <laughs> <laughs> role playing everything. is vastly underestimated and i think underappreciated um in, in, as as an art form or as a practice uh, with actual skills that you need to be able to do it, um, you know, from a beginner all the way up to advanced. Uh, I think, DBJ, you were even saying that there are people who, like Hollywood actors now that will televise themselves or, or uh, live stream themselves doing role-playing games. And oh. all these people tune in to what? Because they're, they're improving with a professional acting background, which is an incredible... Mm. that's the highest level of improv you know you can get so uh, from, from what i understand uh joe mangianello i believe yeah that sounds right his name yeah. has like the I, I i suppose if you had to have a status tier has like the 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 most well-known highest paid hollywood um uh artistic and um professionals in his tabletop role-playing games including like um there's like videos of how he has the had this handmade table for his games and wow. they're like execs and directors and costume designers and such that wow. come over to his place and, and play role-playing games. And he even has his own brand of, uh, of uh, merchandise related to Dungeons and Dragons and such. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing how it went from a very underground geeky, you better not talk about it or you'll get, yeah. you know, thrown in a locker kind of thing. <laughs> and then of course the, um, the the uh, satanic panic during the uh, the the 80s and now it's like a uh, badge of honor amongst um uh, amongst those uh, in the know that uh, that love role playing games and such so. yeah you're right when 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 i was growing up in the 80s you had your friends that you role played with but you didn't talk about it you you know you know like you said you might get beat up for it or you know you teased pretty harshly so it was definitely not the cool kids 
thing. It's but funny you <laughs> bring this up on the Moby tour often during the show, he would be like, anybody out there playing Dungeons and Dragons when they were younger? And he would talk about it in shows. So, you know, we got a little theme going so on. So Moby played D and D. Oh yeah. Okay. He went up in my book uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Now there's so many different role-playing adventures to choose from. Like, it used to be like pretty limited, right? It was Dungeons and Dragons and then, but it was always mostly medieval fantasy. There was Star Trek, uh, there was some Star Trek uh, like battle games and things like that. But um, now if you like the movie Blade Runner, boom, there's the core rule book. You know, you like uh, Alien, there's seven uh, adventures that all take place. So it, it has really evolved and uh, I, I love seeing that. There are um, uh, role-playing games have, have expanded so much that the, the, is considered indie role-playing games uh, use uh, many dramatic techniques to tell a story. Uh, some of them, of course, not using dice at all, but other uh, storytelling elements to uh, draw emotion out of people that have nothing to do with uh, like action and adventure. The most notable games of which I can think of, one is called Dread that uses a um, Jenga tower. And hmm. it's like a horror it can be told like a horror story. And every time you, you want your character to take actions, you have to draw so many blocks and from the, you know, the stacking tower. And if it falls over, you know, um, dread befalls you and, and such. And so in the story, of course, there isn't a tower, but the, the palpable danger of making it fall down translates to the tension built amongst all the people playing that oh if you take this next step or you take this next action or you run away from the from the the evil shadowy creatures or whatever in the night that are chasing you you pull the tower and it falls down guess what you were you were your soul was ravaged or you were you know killed by the by the um you, you know serial killer or something like that that um, is a very uh, out of the box the, approach it, it's it's a um, in the indie RPG scene, which is kind of like a niche of a niche <laughs> within <laughs> tabletop games, um, there are people who are being very creative. Another one is called Ten Candles, where each person at the table Able lights that one up. ten candles. Yep, there it is. Abel Phoenix even put it there. Ten candles. So you light ten candles, and and as the story progresses to do something dramatic that you want to have happen, you blow a candle out. And if everyone's playing in a unlit room except for the candles, at one at some point there will be one candle left, and you blow that one out, and the story ends at that point. It's it's very oh. it, and and so like with um, the creative aspects of people that play in the tabletop role playing community is is immense from the the artists, the costume designers, um, and of course we have writers, um, people who are editors, uh, layout artists, and things like that that are specialists in their own right, um, artistically. And um, they have also been pulled into the tabletop role-playing community, as well as, let's be honest, a, a lot of us tabletop role players, we, we wanna be playwrights. We wanna be, um, we wanna be script writers. We wanna write novels and such as well. <laughs> and we just happen to be playing out our stories with our friends and our family and, and online and such. So. Uh, th there's a little bit of that. Uh, so sometimes there are horror stories where someone is literally trying to write their story with, with their friends and, and the friends just happen to be spectators and they're like, no, this is a game. We're supposed to be interacting with these things. But right. um, And there are many actual role-playing games based on novels as well. Um, the, the Expanse is, a, is an excellent example of a group of individuals who I believe wrote The Expanse for a video game it went under, they saved that information, started playing a game, turned it into novels. Those novels became a televised series. Then the series became a role-playing game. So now people can play those. So wow. yeah, yeah, it went through a, it went through a number of iterations. Cool. So the Expanse is awesome, by the way. The, I, I, read, I read the books, but man, the, the TV show on Prime, unbelievable. It kind of blew me back because it was, it was such a different look for sci-fi with ships and stuff, the way everything, it wasn't dog fighting like in star Wars. It wasn't giant capital ships like in star Trek. This was like kind of believable semi NASA looking things that were very fragile. You know, you just fire a projectile it goes right through the whole ship and it's like, that's, it's a nail gun. 
I love the expanse. So I gotta check it out. Yeah. Did you watch it, uh, Retro? No, no, not yet. Lucy, have you got to get out of here? I got to bounce. My parents just showed back up with some furniture, (laughs) so my family just came to visit today. Sorry, I wish I thought I had more time. I'll no, no, contact okay. you, and we'll we'll have you on yes, the stream. It was so nice meeting you, Lucy. Oh, so yeah, nice yeah. to you guys. <laughs> Heroes, heroines, labyrinth, the evolution, the next, the truth of the hero's journey. You guys, it's big. I'm super excited to be a part of it. Yes. Love you all. <laughs> Bye. Take Lucy, care. I'm so, so glad you could make it here. You have no idea. <laughs> it was amazing. Nice to all meet right. you. Nice we'll see you, you later. Take care. <laughs> That's okay. awesome. Lucy, by the way, wrote the music on the audiobook for Faraway Bird. Oh, she's the you got you should talk oh, that wow. one. Yeah, so she, I, um, she, she's the one who wrote the uh, Faraway Bird music. Yeah, I didn't know she was going to leave. Um, I didn't. She said her parents just got in town, so it was going to be tenuous. But uh, um, she wrote the music for it. Yeah, she. Um, which I think is amazing wow. uh, music. Right. Yeah. Well, she's got to come back. She's got to have yes. her own episode. She's going to have to have her own episode. Oh, that, that would throw be her in the fire by having her on with all of us. <laughs> you got to throw her in the fire. That sounds great. <laughs> so if, uh, I could, if I could segue this little, you know, of course, back to the, the heroine's labyrinth. Um, we, we know, and just to let those who are, are watching um, or may see this later, that um, we all know that the, uh, this is a non-gendered storytelling yes. uh, framework. And yeah. um, to give one of my favorite examples of what I feel is a heroine's labyrinth story with a, a very male protagonist is the Black Panther movie. Uh, yep. okay. A little standee right here <laughs> over my shoulder and uh, Black Panther behind me. And um, <laughs> that storyline is our main character, Black Panther T'Challa, comes back home to his country and uh, has to um, take on the mantle because of the, the death of his father. So we have a character who's left, went out adventuring, met the Avengers in, in the movies and such, and then comes back home and now has to navigate the labyrinth. And we follow this character amongst many other people in his life that have their, um, we, we learn their opinions on the status of Wakanda and the the nature of this hidden nation with the holographic shell over it and such. And so we're introduced to it along with um, with our main character, who now is home, has to navigate the labyrinth socially and politically. And Mm -hmm. we, of course, we have our our masked minotaur, Tars, in there. Who can he trust? Who's on his side? And um, we even have a, a little bit of the dare I say, the poisoned apple in terms of the heart-shaped herb that gives Black Panther and takes away Black Panther's powers. And we get to see that twice in the movie. We get it. It's introduced to us in the beginning of the movie where he's stripped of his Black Panther powers and he has to com- combat. And then we're shown at the end. And guess what? We also have um, um, we have the beast as ally. Mm-hmm. With Mbaku, who's a great, who's an excellent character that was introduced in the Black Panther movie. Mm-hmm. Because in the beginning, we're like, oh yeah, that's the bad guy. Yeah, he's awesome. <laughs> and then and then it's, you know, we have a twist of sorts. And then um, and so anyway, without going into that movie, I find that the the um heroine's labyrinth, um, although I I believe it's a great framework to telling many, many um female gendered stories, it's not reserved just for that. There's a ton of male centric stories that absolutely fall into the, that where you can literally pinpoint each of the the story structures that you detail and go, yeah, yeah, that's what that is. That's what that is. And instead of trying to shoehorn a a journey and it, it seems not to fit when our character isn't physically and politically and socially moving anywhere they're just spiraling in this web of um, various things and i've always felt like along with the black panther movie a lot of uh noir stories detective noir stories fall in this as well where Mm -hmm. we have our character who um is introduced to a labyrinth of a darker nature a cult Um, of deception 
Yeah. 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 Look, all the Sam Spade stories are like that. You know, you, you've got the mysterious dame who's actually the Minotaur figure, right? You've got all that. So I actually, I asked for forgiveness. I had to step away to take a call. And now I actually have to step away uh, to do yep. something. So I'm going to have to say my farewell. So forgive me that I had to came in and out. DVD. I've just subscribed to your channel and I asked for forgiveness oh. that I wasn't here for much of your wonderful conversation. Oh, you'll uh, love yes, this channel. And, and Cameron, thanks again so much for, for not just being here tonight, but thank you for that as well. But for uh, the early support, uh, I think I've, I've mentioned it several times uh, uh, after taking the early manuscript to you and, um, and hearing back from you, because Cameron is very blunt. He, will, he, he doesn't yeah. sugarcoat things, which, which is very valuable uh, to a, a writer. Um, he, he had a, a lot of, he had his criticisms, but he also had a lot of positive things to say. And it really uh, was a confidence boost. And he's been helping me along the way, uh, all the way to this moment. So for that, I thank you again. And um, obviously we'll catch up around the bend. <laughs> so yes, subscribe. Thank you, for bringing up my, thank you for bringing up my Patreon. You know, for those who aren't, you know, some members of the Patreon are now in the chat and people are actually talking about it on the Patreon. It's great. Uh, and so people are watching from the Patreon, but those who would awesome. like to join, that's the best way to get in touch with me. And you can do, uh, you can do, uh, you can consult with me through that. I just actually did a, an incredible two and a half hour screen uh, screenplay consulting with with Brianna with the Brianna from the yeah, channel last wow. Wow. I was like finally I was like it's oh. 11 o'clock I, I need to get some sleep now Brianna but we spent two and a half hours on a really wonderful horror feature script that she's written and we spent two and a half hours on it together uh wow. you know she, she hired me as a consult story consultant on it so if anyone are interested in having that experience you can, you can join my patreon contact me the higher levels get some substantial discounts uh so so the, the link is there Again, Douglas, I'm so proud of you. This is an incredible moment. This is a blessing from God. This is gonna. This is. I really believe you were inspired by, uh, you know, you know, the muse. You're inspired by this, the energy of storytelling, right? To get this out there, and uh, and it will continue to evolve. You'll get feedback. There'll be other editions. There'll be new knowledge. You know, you know, just like we're talking about here right now. You know, about there are male characters that can benefit from this, right? And and you 100%. know, there's. Because this it's going to come down to stories that are linear and stories that are that are cyclical, and you've tapped into the cyclical storytelling archetype, which may be feminine, but it also is universal. So, with that said, uh, thank you for letting me come on here. Please forgive me, our DB Day, for interrupting your flow, uh, and uh, let's you know just let's all continue to uh, stick stick around here because you ain't watching this for me. And let's everyone hit the like button. So, God bless everyone. Retro Net Girl, I'll talk to you. Take thank care. you. Thank you. Touch. Thank you. So good to see you again. <laughs> Cameron's uh, awesome. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. I clicked oh, retro, retro accidentally. Retro, I was going to ask you, um, you <laughs> have got so many different uh, video movies that you have been reviewing for, like over this whole, uh, so many different time periods. I mean, you've, you <laughs> go back to the classics and, and the modern, but I mean, all, how have you seen heroines change? If you've got a female protagonist change, throughout all of these movies that you're 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 watching are there things that you've noticed have you seen the heroine's labyrinth like you know in the oh. in those movies and then uh, you know which are better which are worse and why it's really funny because ever since i've heard about the heroine's labyrinth i see it in like almost every movie that i'm watching <laughs> I was I I saw it like earlier today. I was like, oh, you know, three hundred has it as well. You know, the you know Queen Gorgo's entire adventure is completely um, her her little side, um, you know, heroine's uh, labyrinth. Um, Barbarella actually has a labyrinth in it, in which it, that movie has really inspired me a lot. Um, and um, I, just like I had a, a whole bunch of them, I wrote down was. Spaceballs, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nightmare yes. on Elm Street, Wizard mm -hmm. of Oz, of course, The Matrix, Dark City, um, has a, comp a huge like cult of deception, uh, and um, of, of course Barbie, Beauty, Beauty and the Beast, the typical ones. Um, even uh, um, a little bit of Metropolis. Uh, has you know quite a few moments there uh, where you can see, I, I just see it everywhere I just see it, it it's like now I that's all I see <laughs> awesome. I was like that's what amazing. happened to the hero's journey <laughs> <laughs> that is all that is amazing because there are times where I'm watching a movie and I'm like that's a labyrinth and I'm like 
Doug, shut up. You know, you think everything's a labyrinth now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so well, it, it, it's, it is weird that it does seem to keep showing up. You know? <laughs> so you it is. a little bit better. <laughs> oh, no, no. And, and, you know, it's funny. I, I wrote a, a quite a few stories um, a long time ago and I, I discussed with you and Keith about how I'm developing them for some uh, possible uh, projects that I'm working on. And those stories also have tons of evidence of the, the heroine's labyrinth that really? I wrote back in the 90s. So it's like, it's it's definitely something that is intrinsic to storytelling and it's it's everywhere you look, you know? <laughs> so really? I, I even saw it in um, Conan the Barbarian and, and just, <laughs> um, there is a, a mound scene that kind of works like a labyrinth. Oh and, yeah. Um, there's definitely a, an, a masking, uh, an unmasking. There is um, a, a great shield maiden moment. At the end. Shield mo yes. With okay. Stop it. Yes. You want to live forever. Yes. And there's a failed shield maiden when Conan's village is sacked. His mother yes. stands up yes. against the, uh, and Thulsa Doom delivers a poisoned apple, which yes. is a way to bypass the heroine's defense. And yes. then, of course, he decapitates her, which is awful. I mean, it's horrible. But you see these these um, uh, these archetypes. You're right; they, they are at work, and I quote some of them in the book. So you're uh, exactly correct. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's wonderful. I'm I'm I just can't wait to see. You know, because this is actually kind of cool. I mean, I was thinking today, like if you get uh, into a writer's block, which is like a typical thing for a lot of writers you could just go to the list and just see like okay where are you what what could you add here do you need um it, you know one of the um one of the archetypes at all like you know do you need a cult of deception you know do you need a poisoned apple here and to just switch things up and or or do you need a black swan <laughs> that will that that will you know that could change your story up really really big. I just so I'm writing Theodora's book two, yeah, and I was uh, and it started to feel too plot driven, and I look I'm like okay I'm about I'm in the early I'm in Act One still and I I literally looked at the I was like a black swan, so I have this huge snowstorm come in and just completely devastate the city. It, it, it altered the story, but it also gave it a, a level of freshness that a, an overly plot driven story can start to feel like it is, you know, yeah. um, yeah. kind of like what DBJ was saying is sometimes you have a dungeon master who's telling his story or her story and and the rest of us are trying to role play. <laughs> um, so it breaks that up. You know, the, the black swan just sweeps in and upturns the it's, story and your hero yeah. is dealing it's with it. Reboot or restart almost. Cause now, you know, that that's, that's something that you have to kind of deal with or like um, when, when we have someone like Sarah Connor, um, you know, that changes her black swan, like changes everything in the story for her. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think that it, that this is, um, that's so, this is something that's going to help a lot of writers Good. uh in a in a major major way in a major way so um yeah you're you're doing you're doing something amazing oh, well, thank here. you retro <laughs> my main goal was to help other writers and, and it's important to establish that because there was a lot of different things that people were telling me i should do with this and, and i was like you know what and i tried i tried to accommodate you know all these other and i was like you know what this come my place of love comes from Blade Runner, Aliens, Terminator, Star Wars. You know that that's my. So I don't want to be. I don't want to try to be something I'm not. So my goal it started as notes for helping me with my first book. So my goal has will always be to help other writers. So when you just said that, I'm like that's all yeah. I wanted to hear. <laughs> as yeah. long as you think it's going to help other writers than that. that oh yeah, it, it definitely will. Cause when I was looking at, you know, my old story, I was like, Oh, well maybe, maybe that's what I need. Some, one of these elements to help me, you know, kind of bridge the gap in, in certain areas where I, I wasn't sure of where there's, uh, I think, I think one of the things about writing, especially if you're, not very accomplished at it or you you're just testing the waters or you, you know you have great ideas but you don't know if you can write is like just getting the courage to 
try to complete something and sure. uh and 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 there could be like trepidation like oh well um uh i i maybe i need to learn more about storytelling in order to get there what this is a great uh, and I wouldn't call it like a hack necessarily, but it's a tool to help you kind of think of more areas to fill in gaps if you need, you know, that, well, that, helped, that actually there. helped the story. I, I, I absolutely agree. And, and coming from the, uh, the role playing side of this, um, what, you know, the vast majority of role playing games are uh, fantasy, um, a pseudo uh, sword and sorcery. Uh, pseudo uh, medieval time periods and such. And there are a lot of mythological monsters and adversaries and enemies in these. And if I can be a little bit binary um, with this, a lot of the adversaries either fall on one side and they're, they're uh, bestial and very aggressive, uh, bloodthirsty, very openly monstrous. And then we have our other side of the, the adversary part, which is the the, the subtle uh, mind control, uh, manipulative, uh, shape changer, charmer or something. And with that, those enemies, those adversaries, it, because in tabletop role playing, your heroes are only going to be as good as your bad guys they go up against. Huh. And when telling some of these stories, it's like, well, okay, I know what a big bestial monster that wants to rend flesh from our, our, um, our heroes is trying to do, but what about the subtle ones? What do they want? Like, because many times they're not nihilistic. They want to manipulate governments or huh. um, coax magic power out of our, our protagonists and such. And as a tabletop role player, I'm going, well, how do I tell, how do I tell that story? How, what's that part? And the, the idea of the sacred fire is like, oh, well, they want something from our main characters, but what do they want? Do they want money or their status or their influence? Sometimes just their, sometimes they just want their labor to do something um, yes. or use them as scapegoats or whatever. And the, 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 uh, your, um, your uh, definition of the labyrinth really falls into that, which tells these longer range stories. If I'm getting together with my friends every two weeks, role play i can have the the big bestial monsters that they can go slay with the sword and spells but then i also have um a great storytelling framework to say okay what you guys do is going to now reflect on what i'm going to present in front of you and we get this improv back and forth with these uh other adversaries that are more subtle hidden um manipulative and even even when our main characters know who they're up against society itself is like yeah. hey we're manipulated by the the uh, social apex individual you can't strike back against them in a traditional manner of drawing your sword and having a public battle now Beautiful. you have to be more socially adept more politically adept maybe maybe it's more of a um shadowy thing like a heist or whatever mm -hmm. and uh so it really helped me come up with um some language to think about stories and role playing, and of course that translates into storytelling and other things as well. Because I, I, you know, I have I written any novels or anything? No, but I'm like, ooh, this I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, um, uh, the, the, I am my mind fuel has now been ignited, and uh, and so I love that. <laughs> so. so let's say we got uh, first of all, Brianna is not able to join us tonight on stream. But she's in the chat. You guys have noticed she's in the chat. So I know she is sending love and energy and all of that to that. So I want I want to be aware that Brianna is is not able to make it here tonight in person, but she is here in the chat. So she is with us. We want to take special note of that because obviously Brianna has also been an incredible awesome. Person. And next week, Brianna has yeah, well, what's going on? Right. Yeah. And next week oh, on yeah. Wednesday, it's going to be an odd time for table talk, but Wednesday. After Doug is having his physical launch on Tuesday, but then on Wednesday, Wednesday, seven o'clock, we're going to do a watch party for Brianna's new short film. Yes. So we're going to be able to watch it live on stream. So that will be here. So Wednesday, we'll be watching that together and watching that for her first release of her new film. 
So uh, that'll be a table got- talk one two punch. It's gonna be it's gonna be <laughs> yeah, this has been this is gonna be an incredible few days. All right, we've got two more guests to bring on. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm gonna do them one at a time, but before we bring on the guests, I just want to point out that if you're new, if you're coming into the stream, there are two links that you really need as we go into basically our final hour here. The first is that we're here because we are launching Doug's book, The Heroine's Labyrinth. This is an alternate story structure to the hero's journey. And its its physical release is going to be on Tuesday, but we're doing a, a virtual launch party for him right now to celebrate its launch because we believe, according to Amazon, this is the last day that you need to order it right now. And then Amazon is saying that you will have it in your hand on Tuesday, which is the actual physical launch of the book. So on Amazon, I just put that in the chat so that you've got that. Uh, that's where you need to go in order to get the books. This is the, the, the virtual launch party, last day to get it, to, to order it, to get it in your hand on the actual physical launch day on Tuesday. That's what we're doing. Right. But then also in about an hour, we are going to be drawing for Doug's, uh, for three copies of signed books of the Heroine's Labyrinth. Doug has said that he will give away three copies, sign them for you, put in a message for you. Uh, if you would like a free copy then, then you need to go to this link. We're going to draw for three. We'll, that's the last thing we'll do before we close out the stream. We'll draw for three free. Uh, the link just went back into the chat right there. Put your first name, your email address. We will draw randomly three people, and then you will get a free copy of the Heroine's Labyrinth. So we really appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Next up, let's see. I, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, James Bacon first. Yeah. Okay, so James Bacon is coming on. So welcome, James. Looking very sharp tonight. Oh, oh thank you so much. Awesome. Hello, hello, DBJ. Hello, Retro Nerd Girl. Dog. I don't know how you expect me to follow that incredible parade of talent and charisma, but I guess here we are. <laughs> Well, it's because, so let me explain how James Bacon here is critical to the Heroine's Labyrinth. It's because he was one of the people to come on, and you can watch the the streams here on this channel. Uh, James Bacon came on and challenged Doug. We hosted the conversation here. This was several months ago. This was like probably, I don't know, six or eight months ago now. I don't know. It's been a little while. Uh, Several months ago, Doug got to have, he already had basically a thesis defense with Brianna because Brianna came on and challenged Doug on all of his points about the heroine's labyrinth. You can watch that replay here on the channel. But then James Bacon did the same thing. So James Bacon was critical in challenging Doug in an academic way on the heroine's labyrinth and was won over. You want to talk about that, James? Yeah, it was was a funny process because I was... You know, as Cameron had explained, I was very uh, negative, I guess. We'll just <laughs> flat, say it flat. I was very negative at first when I first approached the Heroine's Labyrinth. Um, I was too sold on Campbell's journey. I thought that it was just a reinterpretation of the journey. But the more I actually did the research myself, because I wanted to, uh, I wanted to sort of take the same path that Doug did, obviously in a much more limited, narrow way, because I feel like the only way that it made sense for me to be able to challenge was to actually do the work. So I did the work. Uh, the movie that I picked was the Hun- Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame. So not the original telling, but Disney's. Oh. And I picked it for a very specific reason. The Hunchback is not a hero's journey story. It's a tragedy And in my view, in order for the heroine's labyrinth to be completely divergent from the hero's journey, it needed to be able to stand on its own apart from movies or stories that had already been identified as a hero's journey. And it it nailed everything. And because it's a tragedy, it's, it's completely removed from the hero's journey. And because it's Disney, it had a happy ending. And so (laughs) those two crucial changes now, obviously, doesn't always need a happy ending, but those two crucial end or crucial changes were really what kind of started to bring me around. Because when you do start to change things structurally like that, when you change the structure of a tragedy and it has a happy end, it's not a tragedy anymore. You know, when you when you completely remove the structure of the hero's journey and and you establish it as something else, that's what it is. It's something else. And so I started to take the movie and piece by piece, according to um, the materials that Doug had benevolently given me, um, I started to plug them in and everything fit. And it fit in such a way that didn't make sense 
under any other structure. And that was it. So like literally by the Ooh. time I had sat in front of him to challenge him, I, I was already one. Of them. <laughs> he um, didn't tell me that, to go that way, but I still, you know, I still went through with it. I still issued my challenges. I still had all my notes with me. Um, and, and it was a very fun time. And, and I think, you know, Doug was able to defend very well. Um, and I, like I said, he won me over before we even sat down to talk, but, uh, well, to be opinion. honest, um, people who are skeptical are, I don't view that as bad. Um, skeptical people usually really care about the subject matter and really want it to work with it. So there's a, there's a big difference between someone who's being mean spirited, you know, uh, and someone who's like, I don't believe you because I don't understand what you're saying. It doesn't make sense. How do you justify this? How does this make sense? That's good. That, so I felt, even though it was a, it was someone challenging me, I felt that it was a good discussion because there was multiple was. times oh, well, that I was, I was trying to answer, and I was like, "Man, I need to answer this concisely. I don't have all day." So through the process, I was able to find language several times, which I then took and put it back in the book. I was like, "There was one time I was reading through the book. I was like, oh my god, I don't use this phrase in the book. That's like the key phrase to explain.'" And it came from a discussion like with James Bacon, for example, where, mm -hmm. I, where I found the language to address it more specifically. So I went back and made another round of revisions uh, after four years. So it it was such a crucial process um, to have that, to, to be forced to explain yourself is, is important. So um, uh, very different from what it was with DBJ, where I wasn't trying to explain myself. We were like going back and forth live like now like playing you know ping pong like with the idea so like immediately trying to apply it which was useful in a completely different way so it was, <clears throat> it's been very interesting to see how the how the discussions of it have played out so and jane that's why i want to say thank you that's why i've included you in the acknowledgments as well um you know well, i thank you for that and i thank you for the opportunity and as you said it never came from a place of uh, uh negativity it was it was literally just a I don't believe you, but I want to. I, I wanted I wanted to believe you. I wanted to buy in. And that's why I did all the work, because I again, I thought that it, it was necessary to do the work to get the buy in out of me. But once I did the work, it was you know, it was plain as day and I had been won over. Um, and it's it's uh, I hope you go far with this, Doug. I hope that it's a very exciting journey, and I hope that you go really, really far with this. I hope they teach you in university level creative <laughs> writing courses, and I, I, you know, hey, maybe you turn this into some sort of uh, uh, teaching job. Maybe you become a, a university professor at some prestigious university teaching creative <laughs> writing or whatever, wh whatever path you are now set down. I hope it is a, a very successful, very enjoyable one. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's really hard to imagine teaching at a university. This is the poison <laughs> apple. <laughs> right. We've got one more guest. Let me bring on our last guest. We have the whole the whole panoply right here. Our final guest for this evening coming on, also a very important part of this channel and show, is Sable Phoenix. Welcome. <laughs> Sable Phoenix. Hi, How Sable. You doing? Hello, sir. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. You're a guy? Yeah, yeah apparently <laughs> so. It's news to me. <laughs> who That's said that? But, uh, who Remind me. Cameron, who said that? Cameron. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's not the first time that I've had that happen. I take it as a compliment, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I, I got you. <laughs> That's um, awesome. But it, that just goes to show, I, if he was still here, I could wag my finger at him and say, well, that means you've never actually watched the Star Trek Six discussion, right? <laughs> well, you know, um, there's something called uh, gender genie. Look it up. Yes, you can do it right yes. now. No, uh, and it can tell uh, if you're a man talking, or a woman based on what you with, write uh, in there. So, what was funny is I took text from Faraway Bird, plugged it in, and it was like male. I was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> really? But then, uh, on, as the story went on, and I got deeper into the story, I started fooling it. It was like yeah. female, strong female. I was like, oh, okay. So I was able to to get that. <laughs> So it's it's pretty fascinating. It gives you like a score, like how male, and it's got like things like they like uh, apparently, <clears throat> like guys for example will say something like, "I have to go to the house to go get the you know yeah. the, the newspaper." Yeah. Whereas I guess women will say, "I have to go to her house to get her her 
sister's newspaper, like a little right. more specific, you know. So it's just interesting what it picks on to identify. You know, <laughs> yeah, much more possessive language. We'll have to take Chable's so. chat comments and plug it in. And <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, yeah. But I, 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 I'm I, very um, honored to be here, so thank you for bringing me on. I Because I, I, I don't have, like, all that much influence on the heroines labyrinth directly like not like james or or anybody else who's been on i'm nobody like i don't have a youtube channel i haven't you're not published nobody. anything <laughs> well i mean as far as in like i don't have a, a name where people would say oh yeah that's that's the guy who did this or that or the other thing but um but i will say that uh much like dpj <laughs> as soon as as soon as like the instant that Doug started talking about um, uh, the archetypes in Heroin's Labyrinth on the first time he was on Table Talk, I still remember it. It was back last March, <laughs> um, yeah. so literally a year ago. Um, and I was like, "Oh, of course!" Boom! That because I've been steeped in in Campbellian um, imagery and and mythology in general, like. Um, uh, I, it's hard for me to say when it it became a lover of, of mine uh, or if it was just something that was always there probably at the it probably started with uh with my dad reading my brother and i the hobbit when we were kids or something like that um but mythology has always been something fascinating to me the archetypes within it always resonate with me i tend to think about things in archetypal imagery and archetypal terms mm -hmm. um and and Doug, in fact, when I got out here to Texas, I'm I'm on uh, I'm on the stream from a guest room right now because <laughs> I actually moved out to Texas uh, just about a, almost a month ago now. And, I got to meet Sable, and, and we got to meet, we got to go to uh, to the Emerald Tavern to have a beer. And I cannot tell you his real identity, but it is not Sable. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. And, I, and so, you know, I don't even have a mic or a camera or anything. But anyway, um, he was he was talking about how. Uh, there were like four different kinds of people who picked up on the heroine's labyrinth and and one kind was like what what James here was originally and Brianna both is like the skeptic right it's like okay really now how does this fit and we got to take it apart and then he talked mm -hmm. about the other kind of person who is like it just clicks and as soon as the, he ta started talking about the mass minotaur and the beast as ally and and the cult of deception and the captivity bargain and all of these things that came up, I'm like, oh yeah, that fits here and here and here. Oh, and that one's, oh yeah. And then and then people start asking questions in the chat. I'm like, no, but this is what that means. And like, <laughs> it's like, it, it just it just that's how I knew immediately that it was real. That this is he's tapped into something that is um, true in a way that it, when I say true, I don't mean like factually, I mean as in speaking to um, human re perception of reality, right? And um, I firmly believe just as Chris uh, Vogler said that this book is gonna end up right on the shelves of writers and um, teachers and whatever else all over the world, right there next to the writer's journey right there next to the elements of style right there next to save the cat right there next to stephen king's on writing all of that is going to become a staple for sure well that that uh would be amazing um and again if, if that meets the goal of, of helping other writers so that that would be outstanding if we um, make the yin and the yang video about the the hero's journey and the heroine's labyrinth i mean oh, I, right. that would put, that would put your your book and his like next to each other on everybody's shelf yeah, that, that would be awesome. Like I said, I think that's the next step is to really start thinking about how they work together because they often do. And, you, and you then what credit. we need to get, Doug, is have a slip case made that fits oh, yes. and his book together. Oh, that would be awesome. That, that would be really wow. cool. Would it, if you want to. <laughs> and, oh, if, and by the way, this is not something that I've told anybody yet, but uh, Doug gets credit that I've already started jotting notes because I kept, I've kept bringing up yin yang uh, yep. dichotomy multiple times in other streams too. I've already started jotting notes down about that um, as, because it's, because your book has gotten me thinking about that more and it's like, okay, so we focus we focus so heavily on the young journey the 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 hero's journey the outward 
questing, pushing, uh, exploring journey. Um, and so we have a really good idea of how the Yang energy works, but now we can use this to investigate the intricacies of the yin energy and compare and contrast them on a, not necessarily one-to-one -one basis, but on an image-to-image -image basis, maybe. Um, like, for example, a um, bit of a deviation here. When uh, when earlier, when Cam Cameron and Chris and all them and all you guys were talking about that aspect of things, it was it was coming to me how um, how uh, the intersection of images uh, means different things depending on which pers which journey you're going on, and which which journey the particular character is taking. So, ex for example, um, the in the hero's journey, well, the hero is the knight in shining armor, right? He's the he's the he's the savior, the conquering hero. He goes out there and he. He confronts the monster, he slays the dragon, he saves the princess, and yada, yada, yada. But in, but in order to do that, he has to, he has to use his rage, right? He has to be dangerous. <laughs> he's, he, he, he's like, fine, until something happens, and he's like, now I'm angry, I gotta go fix it. And um, that, that power, that very thing that makes him the, in his perspective, the knight in shining armor, when he comes into the hero, heroine's life, she he's the beast because right. the thing that makes him the thing that makes him effective also makes him dangerous not just because not just because he has the capability of doing violence but he's going and looking for trouble and so he's bringing conflict into that world as well mm -hmm. and so um and so of course she's right to be uh reticent at first so sable i have a <laughs> subheader called the knight in shining armor yeah and i have an entire discussion where i'm like the knight in shining armor is how the hero sees himself right and it's not exactly. a negative no you know, he's he's dressed for battle he's in armor yeah that's wise if you're going to slay a dragon he's in shiny armor he has to have a positive opinion of himself or he probably shouldn't be there you know so <laughs> that's yeah. how the hero sees himself it's a positive self-image i know it has some negative connotations in some of the discussion today but i try to i try to save both because what I say is, for heroines, that is not how she sees him in a lot of these stories. Right. She sees him a lot of times almost as just as off-putting, just as negative as the masked minotaur. The, yeah. they're, all, they're doppelgangers of each other to the heroine right. in her story. However, the beast honors the heroine's sacred fire and surrenders mm -hmm. the claim. Mm -hmm. The minotaur does not. Mm -hmm. And that's what differentiates them. And that's a, that's a big deal. Like I was talking about even in... Um, from Princess Leia's point of view in Star Wars, yeah. you know she's captured in the first scene, and, and you see Darth Vader wave, waving a finger in her face. Yeah. But then, you know, thirty minutes later, Han Solo's doing the same thing. You know, they, there's there's a common, you know, the, the Beast and the Minotaur are very similar characters, uh, except one, the human side is dominant, and in the other, it's the animal tyrant that is dominant, and and that and yeah, he, he's unchangeable. Yeah. The uh, the the power. The power dynamic, the power that each one of those figures puts forward is actually the less important power, right? The masked minotaur puts forward the kind of the social apex, um, well respected, high, yeah, he'll high, marshal, high he'll authority. Forces against you, you know. Yeah. And whereas inside, uh, inside he's driven by the the animalistic desire, the the possession, even destruction, and it's the opposite for the 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 beast as ally. He puts forth this front of of potential violence, this militaristic or da or dangerous persona, but inside, he's doing it for the purposes of protection and 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 establishing order, right? Yes, or or, or, or writing or writing injustice. Well, and the the beast is what teaches the heroine a lot of times the power of facades. Right. You know, a lot of these guys are, are pretty beastly on the outside, but, you know, sweethearts on the inside. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the bad boy with the heart of gold, which... Doug, why can't somebody else see the hero as the as the nine shining armor? Oh, that's well, my nine shining armor. Well, people can. But what I'm saying is I've heard um, some criticism that that is uh, all too positive uh, thing. So a lot of people don't like referring like, oh, I don't I don't like, you know, like the modern some of the, the modern thinking is don't have a man save a woman. Don't you know, he's not yeah. a shining. I'm like, well, 
there's a space for the shining armor. There's a space. If I'm going to go in and fight a dragon, I better have a, I better be confident. I better have this positive self image because this is, this could annihilate me. So I don't think it's fair to say that the knight in shining armor is a useless, stupid trope. I think it's a very uh, pertinent trope. I think it's, it's suitable for um, a, a person about to go to a supreme ordeal on the hero's journey. The issue was, and I talk about this in the book, what I call an intersection of monomyths, the famous scene where you have like, um, you know, like the, the, the Perseus, right? In Clash of the Titans, he comes mm -hmm. sweeping in and there's the Kraken. You have Andromeda chained to the, uh, to the, to the mountain side and, and Perseus slays uh, the, the Kraken with Medusa's head. Well, it's like, she's in a captivity bargain. This is a pretty dangerous one too. She, yeah. she's, she's being sacrificed by her, her native culture. This is horrible for her. Mm -hmm. The story ends because Perseus saved her. The story doesn't end for the heroine. She's in act one. She just got out of this. This guy sweeps into her life. This is an interesting development for the heroine. <laughs> She's about to die. And this guy comes in. And, this is great. This is good news. But it's certainly not the end of her story. She's in act one. And he's at the end of his story. So when you say the end or they lived happily ever after, the problem is you, you've ended the heroine story. So she's trapped in this reductive role. Uh, my, my issue is that she's actually not in a reductive role. She only is when we stop and frame the hero alone. But if you look at Andromeda and follow the rest of her story, she's probably going to have something very similar to the heroine's labyrinth. And, it, so, and, it's, what, and it's cyclical too, right? I mean, it, this is what – sorry, I interrupted Heath here. Okay. No, no, it's okay. I, I want to ask Retro about that. Make 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 your point, uh, Sable, and I'm going to ask Retro about that. Okay. Uh, I was going to say it's cyclical in that then if you continue with that heroine story and oftentimes she'll have children or establish uh, um, some kind of a social circle and right. then and then <clears throat> somewhere along the line you have a black swan, right? And then that starts another hero's journey as one of those people around her is now tasks with going and, and addressing whatever that is like you can you can again the yin and the yang is a wheel and they're constantly feeding each other and totally and perpetuating it's, themselves as a cycle well like dvj said like long form role playing yeah you know, if you have just the hero's journey you, you start to run out of space and then you're just doing <laughs> side quests you know yeah I, yeah I, i've fallen into that too dvj where i'm like god i gotta think of something for these guys to do <laughs> and they know it they know that you're just thinking of things for them to do. So well, if the, I could the labyrinth to... gives you something to kind of work on, and then you could go on another quest, a real hero's journey. And then if you're staying in society, you might start running into these other elements. Just for example, in role-playing. DBJ? Well, well as an um, armchair observer, um, I, I see this cyclical story being told in um, – military memoir stories soldiers that have come back from war and oh, um yeah. westerns so yeah. oh um, yeah Western, so sure. we we see this in westerns a lot where yeah. our um our heroes have been uh they've gone through uh they've literally gone into war or they've they've gone through they've hardened themselves trained themselves to do battle in the journey but now they're back home yeah. and Oftentimes, um, our hero doesn't even fit into society any, any longer. They put, they've taken off their armor, essentially put down the gun. They, they, they wander off on their own. Um, the, the main character, Mad Max, uh, mm -hmm. is, is that kind of character that um, they've been so changed by their journey that they don't even fit. They feel they don't deserve to have the um, – to be embraced by a community even – and when we see a lot of the like the war stories, when these uh, soldiers come back home, when it's told from the point of view of the families that have these soldiers come in, yes, they are the hero in their journey. But when they come back in, you know, the story wants to let us know, OK, are they are they a masked minotaur are okay? or are they the beast because they're acting the same way? Mm -hmm. And then depending on whether you know how true to life it is or or the point of the story does our our is there any kind of um atonement for our our um character with the psychological harm that's mm -hmm. told in the in these stories and a lot of times like in the westerns you know the the lone gunman 
gets pulled into this, you know, yes. socio political thing where it's like, oh, I've got to pick up the gun, and you don't really want me to do that. And then, and then they, they <laughs> warn everyone, you really don't want me to be part of this. And then someone tries to warm their heart, and they go, okay, and they and they sacrifice their their um their growing good nature to put the armor back on, to grab the weapons, to essentially sacrifice their own humanity, to to murder kill the people who yeah. um are doing harm to the community. And then they many times at the end of those stories, they look back at the person who they care for. And what do they do? They ride off in the sunset. They don't retire back there because yeah. they know, you know what, I'm too much of a beast to stay here. I can't be with them even though i cherish who they are and and um and so for me what you came up with it wasn't me challenging it it was um it was having something on the, the tip of my tongue and not remembering it it was uh because the moment <laughs> you put words to it i was like that's exactly what it is that's yeah. what and yeah it's so funny how many stories are told dare i say accidentally yeah, which runs exactly in this format. There's a yeah. there's a, a, a unsung hero movie of mine called The Cell. It's a um, J Lo oh, yeah. movie, yeah. and it's oh, yeah. oh, I, I got And see that, that movie, cell. boom, 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 every aspect of your framework. And I'm going, that's what, wow, that oh, awesome. it's everything. It's 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 so strange how um, natural your framework is in terms of storytelling that I believe some people are doing and not. They don't. They don't have the terminology for it, and I think the, it's amazing. The unconsciousness or subconsciousness is kind of part of the deal, you know. It, because I also tell myself, there's a lot of stories that that don't don't make it. These are the ones that did, and my my theory is they made it for a re. The cell made it to the finish line because it worked. It worked with people, and you know, uh, the Unforgiven has kind of the Western trope you were talking about, you know, where the gunslinger <laughs> comes back and gets involved in in the city. Uh, at, well, he's an assassin, but um, also, you know, I always think about, you talk about like um, the warrior who returns and doesn't fit into society. I always think of Frodo at the yeah. end of Return of the mm -hmm. King. He's like, sometimes there's no coming back. Frodo literally couldn't go back into society. He had to leave because there was no place for him. So yeah. how, about, That's a much, uh, how about Suicide Squad, DBJ? Uh, Is that a, an accidental well, Western? Okay. I, well, I hadn't thought about it, but I mean, I it kind of is. Which yeah, one? Yeah. Is. Which yeah. one? Suicide Squad or the Suicide yeah. Squad? Kind <laughs> of is. The what? Suicide Squad was actually watchable. The first one was not. Yes, Retro that's yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. That's the one I'm talking about. Okay, the Retro. What was your what's one. your insight into the the knight in shining armor? Whether uh, 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 thinking of yourself as that or perceiving somebody else as that. What what is going on in that in, in movie? Well, uh, it brings me back to, I'm not sure exactly where I heard it um, in relation to the conversations that we've been, that you've been having on the channel. But I, when I think of the um, mass Minotaur uh, and the shining, so-called shining armor or beast as ally, they're supposed to be, a, at least in my mind, I, I was figuring that they would be kind of the opposite of each other, but also match each other in strength, you know, in, the hero and power. And the hero? Yeah. No, um, the the nine shining armor and the, and the Minotaur of the beast. Ally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, as the beast's ally, uh, and then uh, and then the, the mass Minotaur, they, sh they should be able to match each other. But also they don't have to actually have a fight like an actual physical fight like in in the, in the story so that that's actually kind of interesting but it's kind of nice to have that uh the beast kind of does that that thing for you um you know kind of uh helps get you get things done in the story push things along um so yeah i i, I think the the knight in the shining uh armor is is a is a character I think personally for myself. If if you're asking if I like <laughs> Night and Shine, of course, uh, <laughs> I'll take one, please. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I'm not I'm not sure how to use the uh, a character like that for today's uh, audience because a lot of people are definitely pushing back on the standard 
storyteller, um, a st story with a with a knight in shining armor, right. and also the pressure of you know, I, you know, I'll I'll bounce that back to you guys. Like, do you want to be the the knight in shining? It's a nice idea, but yes. the sacrifices. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want to be. Right. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, like, is it? Yeah, I think a lot to DVK's point, <laughs> the, the knight in shining armor is, is, is a tragic story. The, these guys, when they come back, they're not, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, I, I guess if you're going to try to make it a happy story, they build the statue of him, you know, standing there. And But but these guys, they're, they're, if there's PTSD, you know, a lot of these guys, they come back and they, they're isolated or, or feel isolated and have difficulty integrating into society. So, you know, the shining armor moment is the moment before the battle. You know, where all of that confidence, all of that training, all of the armor and everything you've done to get yourself ready. This is me. I look good. And then you go into this catastrophic exchange with a, a deadly culture annihilating militant, you know, creature. And uh, in order to survive that, you may not come out the same. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> We, we've got a really interesting, I think this might, we got about 20 minutes left. And I think this might be a very interesting thing to talk about that uh, Drude and Fuzz, Drude and Fuzz put in the comments. So maybe we can pass this idea. We can start with us. We'll start with James Bacon on this, actually, with this idea. <laughs> Drude and Fuzz says, speaking of Greek figures, this is what I was thinking of that could be a great way to talk about how do we tell the story. Speaking of Greek figures, I want a retelling of Medea yes. as, uh, <laughs> as the heroine, her own labyrinth story. Yeah. I was actually going to write oh, um, a screenplay, ahead. actually. Uh, really? Um, just, yeah, I, I was, uh, first of all, I did a complete and total deep dive on Jason and the Argonauts uh, and went through the entire story. And I was like, Matea! <laughs> uh, loved her story. And um, I, I wanted, it make, the story sounds very bad for her like she's like she's kind of like one of those uh characters that was put in a bad position but she she also did some bad things and it doesn't really look very favorable to her and i wanted to kind of play with it a little bit and kind of make her um not not the bad guy but oh, like all that. of the stuff ha that happened to her and that she gets like the bad rap in history so I, I yeah I, I love, love that idea. Yeah, be, I mean, there there. If you look at this at the story, um, it, and you imagine yourself being in her position, uh, you, you'd say, "Wow, um, <laughs> this is unfair." Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That's awesome. You yeah, see it from really another angle. That's the power of of the story that you could tell. Um, I mean, that's Theodora. She was a prostitute stripper of like ill repeal, like famous and, uh, and uh, people, and you should hear some of the stories about her there. You, you can't get them out of your head. Once you hear them, they're pretty, they're pretty salacious. And because of it though, all of her accomplishments as an empress out the window. So I, I wrote, I'm doing exactly what you're talking about. I was like, I want to write the story that explains what she did and why, because I see it differently. And um, you should, you should write that retro. I, yeah, I want to. <laughs> that would be awesome. See, that, that that's the beauty of it, uh, that you get to go back and recontextualize a, a, a story that's been it's, told a lot of many times. It's a great, it's a great story. And it really is. The sto and, and the story of Jason, like every single accomplishment that he made was because of her. And, uh, and she was forced to do it. She was under a spell. Uh, it's just uh, really incredible, including a spell that had her um, actually murder her brother. And it, oh, it's, geez. yeah, it's just really insane. So, yeah, I, one thing Twice about <laughs> the stories in antiquity, they're just full of so much drama. <laughs> and it, it's just incredible. Like, you can really, um, you know, lose yourself in those wonderful stories. I, I wonder sure. about this. Uh, this may be a topic that we need to do on Table Talk because I'm still getting my, my mind around it. But it seems like sometimes, and you're part of this, Doug, when you're like, okay, I got this story that I'm building around, okay, this guy. 
Uh, but then it turns out that the woman in the story might be more interesting. And then the whole story shifts to be about her. Because you talked about that with uh, Theodore. Yeah, I originally wrote it from Justinian's point of view. From Justinian's then... perspective, right. Yeah. And sometimes like I, I had that. I encountered that when right, thinking about Adam and Eve. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe Eve is actually the more interesting character in here. Uh, mm-hmm. Cameron has had that. I'm going to plug my my uncle's book because my because I, I want to have him on the show too. He did the same thing. He, his book is called An Alien Face, and he rewrote the War of the Worlds. What? But from the perspective of Ruth. So I want to talk to him about the Heroines Labyrinth as well because I I I, I I've been texting him. He's going to come on the show sometime because he, wow. he's, he's also skeptical of. Uh, he says that he's skeptical of archetypes. And I was like, perfect. Come on. Let's talk about <laughs> it. I'm very interested to know if his book here conforms to the heroin labyrinth or what, where those archetypes yeah. appear. If they do, I don't know. But yeah, but he, re, but he's one of the, in that same genre, guys who are like, no, wait a minute. This, the war of the worlds is very interesting, but you know, he and his wife are separated and you don't really hear about his wife. And he said, no, wait a minute. What if, what, what if we followed his wife, Ruth, and figured out what, actually happened hmm. to her in the war of the worlds so we, we've got we've got connections with with these people wow. who have done that um and i want to know more about that from the development of a, of a story about the the female side the female characters who are otherwise unexplored hmm. yeah we need to bring retro on um for some of the heroines labyrinth discussions uh sure you know just to get just to get a, a female perspective you know it's us guys talking about it, right? Sure. So. I'll, I'll, I will chime in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You no, know, it'd be fun. I, I would love, you started making a list. I never thought of that. It might be interesting to try to make a general, a mostly comprehensive list of what stories we feel fit in it. Like DBJ said Black Panther. And yeah, you know, that was it, great. Yeah. So, oh, and yeah. we talked about it. We, you know, we discussed it, but it might be interesting to go through a serious, Blow by blow, blow by blow discussion of Black Panther and how it fits and why and uh, what you know how how these archetypes express themselves in that story. So um, you know th- those are super valuable and getting a list of these stories. God, I, I almost wouldn't want to put it in the back of the book. <laughs> you know, yeah, that would. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We should. Uh, yeah, can you sneak put, it in uh, there? <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've my publishing consultant almost <laughs> told me. When I put the new spiral in there, she's like, it's already uploaded. It's done. I'm like, but I want to change the spiral. <laughs> she's like, you got to you, change. You the can't. Spiral. I'm like, yeah. do it. We have to yeah. do it. I, I think I was watching um, Saturn three. It was done in 1980. And I was like, oh, well, I, I saw some, you know, some similarities there too. There, there, there are a lot of movies that you could probably just an endless group of movies that you could just like you know list off yeah um, well it would be fun to try to find those like marquee movies the the big ones especially <laughs> over different eras um and i think dbj was saying you know it's it's not exclusively for women there are there are sto- i started making a list of some stories that have male protagonists that absolutely follow the heroes or the heroine's labyrinth and uh and it is amazing the poisoned apple showing up for these male characters. How how consistent it is, um, yeah. You know. So anyway, it's it's there's definitely so much more to to explore there. Yeah. I, um, I also like to say, the um, all of us have seen or or um, consumed media where we have a a female character that feels, uh, I dare I say, feels more like a prop or furniture. Than actually yep. having a story, and I wonder—I don't have any evidence of this, but I feel that when we have sometimes when we have our secondary character who just happens to be maybe a love interest female or something like that, that the more they fall into a heroine's heroine's labyrinth story arc on their own, the better I feel the character is written for their. Mm-hmm intricacy into the story itself Mm -hmm. like i brought up 300 got on air and i brought 300 where you you know we we have our king and is it leonidas and the 300 go away and then we have but we we also have her story um i I don't remember the her queen gorgo the queen and it it i remember watching a lot of b movies 
where I'm, I just roll my eyes because I know the, 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 the young woman in the movie is like, okay, there's going to be some point where she's captured and they're, they're going to put her in a skimpy outfit and then the hero comes. <laughs> and I just roll my eyes. I'm just outfit. The, the, the worst, <laughs> I, you're barely an outfit. If, if one. And, and um, the, one of my worst offenders was um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And um, Kevin it was Costner. the worst offender for a lot of reasons. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Amongst, you know, the, 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 the fading in and out of the, the accents and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> this is a character who's a badass in the beginning of the movie. Dark armor, sees, you know, Robin, fights him. And then at the end of the movie, she's like a damsel in distress. And just going like, oh, my goodness, please stop it. And we've seen the, that mistake <laughs> That writing mistake or creative mistake so many times, but then we see another character, and we go that that story was good. Why? And I wonder if it's applying, um, it maybe in, inadvertently, or the writers are um, subconsciously know that you know what we need to give more meat um, to the various characters in the story, whether we're coming in at the beginning, middle, or end of their arc, like Princess Leia. There's a there, we are introduced in Star Wars to Princess Leia that has a story on her own, to uh, separate from all the other characters. She's not attached to. She's not an extremity. Uh, you know, like I said, a piece of furniture or clothing or something attached <laughs> to another character. She's on her own, trying to to pr pursue her own agendas. And then, of course, our characters uh, cross paths and they move on. And then subconsciously, I think maybe in our minds we go, well, that make that took great storytelling technique. So like I said, I don't have any evidence of this, but this heroine's labyrinth framework makes me go, ah, that's why I liked one thing and maybe didn't like another mm -hmm. because um, someone didn't take the opportunity to flesh out their story arc, even if it's in the background um, of, with information that we're not privy to. Totally. In, in fact, I was trying to find it here, but I had five rules for heroines. And rule number one, the heroine is always sovereign, regardless of restrictive circumstances or like repressive environments. She has to be, she is always sovereign. So even if it doesn't look good, she's active. <laughs> and that that that's a major rule uh, for this. And you said something else, you know, with Princess Leia. I, I was mentioning earlier that the, the opening to the, A New Hope, the first 17 minutes is really her story, and then it goes to R2 story a little bit. But I was like, you know, you have her breaking the truce. That's the the great opening scene with her shit. She's escaping her native culture, and you've got Darth Vader bearing down on her. She she entrusts her sacred fire is the rebellion. That's her thing. That's her cause. That's what she cares about. She entrusts this with the fragile power, R2-D2, who then goes on his own little hero's journey there. I was like, you know, if, if Lucasfilm really wanted a heroine-centric story, instead of what they did with the sequel trilogies, I would have loved to have seen act one of Leia's story. The be how she got there, the labyrinth she was in, what got her to the point where she's breaking this truce with the Galactic Empire, risking her life. Join how did she get mixed up with the Rebellion? I would have loved to have seen the Princess Leia story go to completion because... It starts so strong, and then she does kind of get lost in the in the in the rest of, in episode in Empire Strikes Back. And we turn well, she she her her arc over the three movies, like she gets progressively less important. It, it's like a terrible her slide because, yes. like in the first movie, she's basically running the place. Yes, and then in the in the second movie, she is still very important, but she's like the symbolic mm -hmm. leader, although she's lost a lot of operational control. Yeah. And then well, there is the romance between her and Han Solo. Like well, she, then you get that. But then by she, the time you get to the third movie, she's an expendable commando you can send down to Endor. <laughs> like, yeah, with little, she, with she little, she little uh, down, 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 down. Like, and what she, right. <laughs> yeah, I would have loved to have seen Princess Leia's full arc because uh, it was so compelling in A New Hope and so powerful and strong. Um, I think you could have told her full story, and I think. Old audiences and new audiences would have absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> I think that that's, um, I, I think that's going to be going back to what I was saying about correlating imagery uh, on like correlating images on a one-to-one -one basis or archetypes on a one-to-one -one basis. I think that that'll be 
a big strength of having this kind of language available to be able to actually purposefully plan those two um, types of journeys overlapping with each other and making sure they both get a satisfactory totally. progression and resolution rather than one of them just getting lost in the weeds by the time you get to the end of the movie or the or to yeah. third movie or whatever. Well, in I my think, case is you're sacrificing a lot if you don't tell the heroine's story. Right. Uh, she's it, interesting. You know, what's yeah. going on with her is you fascinating know. and has a lot there. So by making her a, a prop or a, a decoration or just dressing, you're missing out <laughs> on, on this massive arc she's probably on. Um, if you just give her, a, if you, if you flesh that out a little bit. And that no, not, happens a lot like that. mythologically. Like I, when I was preparing for our conversation, Doug, um, I went and tried to take myth, uh, female myth, female led myth and fit it into the heroine's labyrinth. It is not easy. And the reason that it's not easy is because <clears throat> usually even in the stories they're headlining, like. Uh, the one that I took was Esther from the Bible. It wasn't Medea, but it was Esther. Very well-known story, very popular. It's very central to certain holidays and certain faiths. Yeah. And I took that story and I tried to make it fit and it wouldn't fit. And it wouldn't fit because of the gaps in the story. Yes. They are so vast. It's pretty much just she shows up and something happens to her. Then all this stuff happened. Then she shows up and something happens to her. So it's, it's she's not even an actor in the story most frequently. There are times where they show up and they do something. Right. But it's, it's so, uh, it's so maddening uh, to not get well, Esther that. does do an unmasking. She does have the unmasking. Yes, of, that uh, she does <laughs> do. She does do that, but it was very difficult to fit her into any of those other. Well, um, well, well that, that is a but, great point. That's it, a great it's point. so <clears throat> rife for storytelling because you can take those characters that are, uh, available to everyone because they're from ancient myth and you can write those stories yourself. And so I would love to see someone sit down and write a Medea or to write an Esther from their perspective with filling all those gaps in and having real honest to God structure uh, uh, to hold it up. Um, so I think it's very doable, thankfully, because of the gaps. But, you know, without having done that and trying to do the exploration, it's so frustrating to, to, to go and try to find something like that. That's actually a great point. Um, the other problem I had, and there are a lot, plenty of uh, tropes from the labyrinth in mythology, but you're right. They don't follow the fullness. There's like snapshots where like Eve, the poisoned apple, that one's really obvious. But there's also Persephone. You know, she eats those pomegranate seeds, which captures her for life into the underworld. So like there's, there's snapshots, but there's probably a greater continuum before and after, which would be very fascinating to follow uh, well, that, to go all the way with it. That depends, I think, on the culture too. Like the uh, the myth of Osiris from Egyptian mythology oh. um, is actually Isis' story, and she drives the whole thing. Um, yes, she does. Doesn't she? Yeah, because yeah. Osiris, Osiris ends up dismembered in a in a in a, in a coffin in the river, um, and so Isis is the one who has to um, uh, resurrect him, right? Yeah, she and she and her sister have to um, do some things together, and and <laughs> it, it, it's a very it's actually a very intriguing myth. It, it there ties to some of the Judeo-Christian myths that ended up following. Anyway, um, but uh, we tend to, I think a part of that is just that we tend to think of mythology as Greek. And that was extremely, um, you know, <laughs> male-centric. Um, but it, it just culturally, that's that's what Greek society was. Well, and so it, it kind of, I think, gives us a bit of a skewed um, because it's so integral to our Western, our Western culture, right? And to, it, it was so integral to Rome, and then Rome, of course, is so integral to everything that followed in Western culture. Um, that uh, that we don't think about stuff like Egyptian or a lot of the East Asian myths. Um, Japanese mythology is full of actual heroines. Uh, um, that go through the entire uh, mm. cycle, you know. Uh, yeah, Amaterasu in particular. Amaterasu is exactly what I was thinking. Of. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, go all the way back to uh, go all the way back to um, uh, um, uh, like 
the Chaldeans and all of them, uh, Inanna, Ishtar. She's she does a whole. Th- of course, she goes on a hero's journey as well for herself, but she does a whole cycle. Um, she does both actually. Um, well, yes, I, I'm not saying that you didn't have you didn't have female centric myths at all in Greek mythology, but no, there's um, there's some there's some great feminine stories there, but yeah, um, but so many of them ended up okay. Now they've contact come into contact with the hero, and now like you were saying, their story kind of just stops there. Um, well, one thing I noticed in a lot of our stories is there are stories where when I start to analyze them, I'm like, this is actually a female centric story. The issue is the filmmaker decided to focus on Jack Torrance, mm. you know, the masked minotaur. So we're following or Corbin Dallas, we're following him around, but it's really her story. Mm. So we're just focused on the beast as ally uh, because, you know, probably guys will be like, Oh, this guy's awesome. Let's, let's see what's going on. Who's this chick. You know, he's got, Oh, he's saving her. That's great. But if you actually break down the structure of the story, it's, it's it's her story. The hero is adopting her cause. That's yes. yes. That would exactly. be a very interesting That's, study to do to take a look yes. at films and see how many what are supposed heroes journey films are actually just us following the beast as ally. Because I bet there's a ton of them. <laughs> oh, there's there a ton. There, well, yeah, and, and that's and that's intrinsic into the whole idea of the yin yang uh, balance as well. Is because like okay, yeah, men. I'll say men because the yang energy is tip is typically viewed as masculine um but whatever the yang energy the masculine energy is the one that's going out there into the wilderness and it's 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 slaying the dragon it's carving it's carving civilization out from 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 uh the wild so to speak but what is its impetus for doing that is like most most guys don't look at uh, look out there and say, "Oh, I'm going to go out into the woods and I'm going to kill a bear and I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, and I'm going to build a log cabin or whatever." What are they doing that for? It's because the feminine desires and needs those things in order to produce civil, produ- in order to produce the next generation, in order to produce the things which make life interesting and meaningful. And so, the the whole beast as ally knight in armor warrior's journey whatever else one of the reasons that star wars starts off with leia's story is because the feminine is the impetus for the action of the masculine well luke and han adopt they, both adopt her cause yeah and they they were utterly they were they were they were kind of helpless until she arrived, right? They well, were he was, a Luke their way. was a moisture farmer. <laughs> yeah, and, and they were just they were they were kind of nobodies. They didn't really have a direction, and then they were kind of fumbling their way through it. And then they get to Leia, and she's like, you know, get this, this big is some rescue carpet you know? out of my way. Exactly, this is some rescue. You get into the garbage. She like she's like. like By the way, that's has... a secret door moment. Yes, yes. Heroines yes. tend to find secret doors. Newt <laughs> does it in Aliens. Yep. Um, yep. Leia does it in that uh, hallway scene. So it's, I always love when heroines find the secret door. I was just watching uh, Ready Player One, which I think is a little bit of an underestimated movie. I really like Ready Player One. Um, Artemis, aptly named after a Greek god, um, also finds a secret door when uh, 101 comes crashing in. So it's just funny seeing heroines with these secret doors. I love it. Mm-hmm. We could, we could have I been pre- going for three hours here, which is about what we said we we're gonna, we were going to go for. We we can we'll wrap up here, but but do you want to? Let's go ahead and make our drawing, and then we. Oh can, yeah, yeah. We can I've only been here right. for an hour, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's in Act One. Yeah. I just, also, I before just you do the drawing, Heath, yeah. I want to thank you for mm-hmm. the first table talk in probably a full year that I didn't have to do any homework. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> this was very different because yeah, there was no homework for this one. Uh, right. There was no homework for this one, and uh, yeah, I mean the number of people who have been on, and you know, I, I was sitting here thinking actually as we've had everybody cycle through and rotate through, and this, this, like, how uh, what amazing connections we have here on Table Talk, and and Doug, yeah. this, this is you may have had I don't know if it's the the coolest virtual launch for all books. <laughs> On, but I mean, it's it's got to be up there, or you know, all nonfiction. This is this is this is we been did really pretty amazing. good. <laughs> yeah, we've never had a show just... like this, and to see every you know with so many people cycling through and doing the rolling panel and stuff like that. But to see how many people who have been involved with this and care, 
and, and especially to all of you guys who are on right now, I mean, thank you so much for being here and, and being a part of this, this whole channel and what we're doing here. This is, this has been incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I've, I've said it in the beginning, but I'll say it again in the end. Thank you to every one of you. Um, you guys have been such a big part of this. I really couldn't have delivered the book, the book that's about to come out. I'm really, really proud of. And a big part, if, if we didn't all do this, if I hadn't talked to TBJ or James or here on table, the book I would have released just would not have been as good. It just would not have been as good. So I give you guys a ton of credit. It was very meaningful to me and it paid a lot of dividends. And you'll see your, you'll probably find your fingerprints in there when you read it. So, <laughs> okay. So to read it. What, what I've got here is I pulled up random.org. Okay. Uh, so this is a random integer. See if I got this right. We we only we've had seven entries. We got seven entries. So okay. We got so Doug said we're gonna draw for three. So I got this right. Like say generate three. We'll just go from the top down. Generate three random integers from one to seven. In five col well in one column. We'll just go straight down. I guess it doesn't matter. But there we go. Uh, we're rolling all right. A, we're rolling a D7. <laughs> we're rolling a D7 three times. Seven, two, and six. All right, those are our winners right there. So I'm going to go down. Uh, I got so many windows up. <laughs> um, well, I swear I just had it a moment ago. There's one name I'm scared of, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I am I am here now. Uh, responses. Okay, I got the first name. So number seven, blue, no anon. Congratulations, you just won. All right, <laughs> so blue, no anon. It won. That's number seven. Number two, number two is Sable. Oh, okay. oh, wow. All right. You know what? I was so afraid that would happen. I realized that I realized when, cause I'm going to have the opportunity to get my hands on the book physically in a few yeah, days. Draw so someone else. Cause draw I, someone I'll else. I should have put my name in there. Okay. So yeah. draw okay. somebody else. We'll, we'll redraw Sable's name. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, the fix was not in. That was just the way that. Uh, <laughs> I was afraid that would happen. <laughs> yeah, I didn't enter I realized after reason, I entered I my wanna, name, I was I like, I shouldn't up. have done that. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so number six is Paul. Okay, Paul, Paul. you won. So Paul, congratulations. Awesome. So Blue, No Anon, and Paul. So I'm going to regenerate then. Actually, let me write. Let me write that down. So what I'm going to do is I've got the emails up, so I can email you and CC you, Doug, so that way you guys can coordinate messages to be written in and shipping information and all of that. Uh, so Paul and Blue No Anon. All right, then let's let's redraw a Sable here. Let's do one, two, three, four, five. We got five. Uh, let's go between one and five. Uh, and five. Generate one this time between one and five. And if it's a two again, we'll re-roll it because <laughs> that was Sable's number. <laughs> right. It's a three. Oh, my gosh. Good. <laughs> three is Robert. Hey, oh, awesome. Robert. Awesome. One of our regulars. Yes. Robert oh, is one of our regulars. Very insightful in his own right. Okay. So I'm going to send, I've got, I've got those emails pre-written up. So I'm just going to drop these uh, into those. Uh, uh, those email addresses in there and then uh and then that way you will have it doug and you guys can coordinate and doug you can get those off thank you for doing that doug that's all okay fun. um how do you, how do you want them to send their address it, I, i'm emailing them but i'm ccing you so you okay, two will just perfect. be in direct contact and then so you can do it however you want to do it perfect uh i figure i'll get mine signed when i meet doug for the first time whenever that is yeah, it's right. got to happen at some point. It's got to, <laughs> especially now that I'm in, in, in Austin area, too. We all got to hang out together. <laughs> yeah, I was able to grab a drink with Sable Phoenix, and it was awesome. We went to a um, DBJ. You would love it. It's called uh, Emerald Tavern. It's a role-playing oh. bar. And yes. uh, they had in the oh, back of the bar. Games and every kind of game. I yeah. know that place. It's every there. game. It's got every game back there. So you could spend an hour just shopping, and then yes. you've got the tables, and it's all like – English pub 
scotch eggs and you know all the, all these like beast you know bar foods like but like gourmet and then you've got the bar so it was like the perfect place <laughs> and, and you can and they have trial copies of the games you can try them out before you buy them it's great. yeah and there's people role playing all over the place there's all these tables with role players everywhere it sounds amazing. Wow. It's awesome. Yeah. BBJ, if you ever come to Austin, I'll take you. It'll be great. We'll grab some drinks. <laughs> I mean, eventually, we're, I said Let's we're going to have to have actual table talk meetups someplace. Yep. So yep. That's yeah. the table con. convention what? and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, yeah. Start, we'll start table con at some point. Film uh, <laughs> table con season three near the Austin area and we'll, uh, we'll all hang out. There you That'd go. Be great. All right. Uh, all right. Let's, let's, uh, uh, DBJ, do you hey. want to, uh, provide any concluding comments and let everybody know where to find you and anything like that, that you, I'm going to bring up your YouTube channel sure. as well. Okay. Um, my YouTube channel is RPD with DBJ. Of course, uh, don't worry about pronouncing your name. I just go by DBJ. Uh, and my channel is a tabletop role-playing game channel, long form discussion, uh, primarily focused on science fiction and Currently, we are taking uh, maybe not the best television and mo sci-fi movies, but great concepts, and then taking them apart and using them for our tabletop role-playing experiences. So we've talked about and will continue to talk about uh, television and movies uh, th that maybe haven't been watched very um, often. Um, the, the event, um, debris, uh, fringe um mm. uh quantum leap and and so many others from the, like the 80s we've we even talked about an old show that i know no none of you may know about unless you're an old grognard uh the phoenix uh auto man um oh, what is a uh, manimal uh, what <laughs> yeah manimal, <laughs> Don yeah. Doe, uh the pretender uh, uh, there's so many of these these shows v? uh haven't haven't gotten the v yet haven't oh, haven't v? gotten that would be we're, awesome. we're gonna do a drama yeah, um, uh, Earth Final Conflict. Oh, yeah. So many of these. Now, Not mind Battle like, Field Earth. <laughs> Battle, <laughs> Battle Field Earth. Battle Field Earth. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, you're so, you, you, Drew, you're so funny. I, Drew made a comment in the chat. So these are long form, about an hour. Um, and it's just uh, having conversations with the, 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 the people that show up. I, I'm, I'm also building a role-playing game it's going to be for free like in in the in the corner of the show so there, there's a lot of i yes i will put v on the list <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, I love v. the original and the reboot yes absolutely mm -hmm. and uh we, we did we talked about the prisoner and many of these things so please come to rpg with dbj it is a daily show that airs 6 a.m eastern standard time so it's uh it's it if you're in the states, you have to be up at a at a uh, god awful time. So many <laughs> individuals are overseas that they, they end up getting to watch it or listen in, and um, yeah, it's about tabletop role playing games. So we get to uh, we get to talk about um, subjects, and some of them may be uh, controversial, but we get to color them in a um, game like setting to. So as not to offend too many people, but we we can get a little deep in there. We get in the weeds. All right, that's that awesome. Is that is thank it. you, thank you, DBJ. You are very welcome. Uh, we'll have to have a crossover event with him, um, RavenCon. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. What? Oh, I need to talk to you about that. That's I, I've got a I've got an online convention I do. Oh, we've just gotten started. Yes. Oh man, yes. I need. Okay. God, I, I'll, I'll message you on that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's like Jay. a natural crossover if you, right there. If you changed your format a little bit, right, and you had uh, Retro Nerd Girl and myself on, my middle, my middle initial is D, so it could be RPG with RNG <laughs> with EBJ and JDB. It would be pretty great. <laughs> yes. We get it done. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be absolutely amazing. I would love to. And, and um, and uh, I, I, I wish I did this more. I love interviewing in um, people, having conversations. Uh, the, the show is very conversational. So um, may, maybe I would like to reach out quite a bit more. And uh, and I don't mind people reaching out to me. And well, I, and I was not insinuating myself onto your show. I was just cracking jokes. I thought it was funny. <laughs> you did quite all right. That was very funny. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, 
All right. Uh, Retro, mm-hmm. you want to let everybody know about yourself and how well, to find you yeah. and what you do? Well, yeah, I, I, um, I love old movies. Um, and so I do a lot of reviews for old movies. Um, I have uh, two live shows that are going on right now on YouTube. Uh, the first one is a, a retrospective on Gargoyles, a TV show. Um, so oh. Going over it, like, and uh, wow, that show is good. Yeah, <laughs> it's a Star Trek reunion, too, with TNG. Nick oh, Nick yeah. Nick. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And um, so I do that on Tuesdays. Um, I'm, I, I'm actually on finishing up the last part of my break that I, I gave myself a two week break. And so I'll be back next week doing that. And on uh, every Saturday, I do a watch party of an old movie, um, usually um, uh, an old sci fi movie. So um, that is just something that I do every Saturday. And then and those um, are getting really popular. I noticed. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, they are. People are, are liking them and I'm just, I, I love doing them. So it's a, it's a win-win situation for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that, that is, uh, pretty much all that I can say about my, myself, you know, come on and, uh, go to the channel, browse around, see if there's anything cool that you might want to uh, do a deep dive on or, um, uh, you know, look on uh, Twitter. I, I post a lot of interesting things on Twitter as well. So, yeah. She's got lots of material. All yeah, right. lots of stuff. Good stuff, too. Yeah, it's great stuff. James, is there any way you'd like to exit yourself with that, like, or, or outro yourself with? No. I mean, I'll see everyone in the comments. And then I'll see you on the Discord. That's where right. I can be found. Sable? Um, I'm looking for... Thank you for for putting this together, Heath. Congratulations, Doug. I am super excited to, to see not just the book itself, but the effect it's going to have in the future. Um, and I uh, appreciate you all... Uh, bringing me on without my camera or anything like that and uh, letting me letting me hang out with you guys <laughs> it's been a lot of fun all right i will absolutely uh, echo that thank you thank you for being here yes uh, likewise. Yes, my pleasure and dbj and rng it's been fantastic getting to talk with you guys yeah great great to actually interact with you in person it was so fun like talking to <laughs> you guys are great. i talk to them all the you guys time. are awesome talking to you guys <laughs> that was we're all <laughs> hat <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> i'm yeah I'm going to leave Doug to last because it's his show, but I guess I will let me give a, a link here because here we go. Yeah, if you, if you're go. here and you didn't know what we were talking about with RavenCon, here is the, mm-hmm. uh, yes, yeah, Sable will be unmasked someday. Someday we'll have to have a, a, a reveal. <laughs> when Sable <laughs> It'll be a, a YouTube event. Uh, yep. The unmasking of Sable Phoenix. <laughs> so, the horrifying <laughs> truth. <laughs> Not right now. I'm confused with ma- unmasking the Minotaur. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> right now I'm doing a uh, Raven con once a month. So the first weekend of April, we will have another Raven con. Uh, we're doing this. This is all a virtual convention. I've got a virtual coffee shop built out. If you take a look at this uh, video, it shows you how it works. You walk around in the virtual coffee shop and you sit down at a table with people. And that connects you to a virtual tabletop where you can play the game at that particular table. We've done, we did, a, we did a test and then we had the very first Raven con, so I actually need to get on this and email everybody who's on the list. And so if you want to come, this is the place to sign up right here. And I'll do a drawing for a free ticket as well. But get on this list right here. And then I will let you know when the Ra- when the next RavenCon is, um, when tickets go live and things like that. But it'll be the first Saturday in April, which means I got to get on it again. And yeah, it was so much fun. We had so much fun. So RavenCon point, there. And at some point, I know we talked about doing RavenCon playing Alien. With a yeah. bunch of us, um, I'm, I'm 100% like really on that. publishing. Yeah, we need to do that. Sure. We need to do that. Uh, so we were talking about Alien. So we'll do the Alien RPG. I'm not sure if. I mean, I'll just have to see. I'll, I'll message everybody in April. We'll get the games together. But if not April, then May. We should, because I know Doug's busy. I mean, we're, this is uh, everything's going on right now. But so maybe May then have Doug in do Alien. Oh, I would love to play there. Alien with you guys. <laughs> that would be so we're, fun. Sign up there if you're interested in playing. It's so much fun. And then also, hey, just come by and go and uh, 
subscribe to the cultist too we're going to be talking about brianna's new show new short film on uh table talk next week on wednesday non-standard date non-standard date but that'll be wednesday but also the cultist you know brianna wrote it uh co-wrote it i co-wrote it with her she and i both wrote it uh i produced it she directed it and so the cultist this is our show which is a lovecraftian comedy uh, a mockumentary style comedy about Lovecraftian cultists who just want to worship Cthulhu and a world full of people who don't understand here they are. <laughs> and so uh, we've been, I've been trying to do a little bit of advertising here and get more word about this out. That's so that's going on now. So we're relaunching the cultists right now. The first three episodes are there. All right, Doug, wrap us up. Well, you may not know, but uh, there's this book called The Heroine's Labyrinth. <laughs> um, yeah, it comes That's out on cool. Tuesday. If you haven't bought it, go ahead and pre-order it. Um, I'm very excited about this book. It came about from writing my first book, which was Far Away Bird, in which my heroine was not following the hero's journey. And so uh, the notes I took from the studies I had done, I just started watching all sorts of movies and reading a ton of books, all the classics with her you know heroine-centric uh, novels comic books, um, all sorts of things, graphic novels. And all of those notes became the heroine's labyrinth. And um, now I get to share it all with you. And I, I can't wait. <laughs> all right. Yes, get it so that it will be in hand. We might do a stream from the lot, the physical launch event on Tuesday, just for a few minutes. You know, we're going to be doing the physical stuff. But if I can, I'll do... With you know, it'll be with portable equipment and things like that. We'll do like uh, the Oscars selfie. You know how they do. Yeah, it. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, so it, it it might be like that. It'll be really informal, but I think it'd be fun to at least be live for a few minutes at the physical launch party. Pre-order right now, and Amazon says you will have it actually on launch day, so you would have it if you have it. You would have it in your hand, theoretically, on Tuesday when we're having the physical launch event. So and just so you know, the, the book. Attention. We yeah. may see a Sable Phoenix unmasking on Tuesday. Well, no, that's, that would be amazing. <laughs> Sable will be there. Put me on the sub. Sable, you have to wear like the Phantom of the Opera mask. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now, that would be funny. Actually, it'd be funny, like if you did the uh, the the Wilson from. Oh, there you go. Home improvement. Care, and like care, every time the, the camera passed by you, there would have to be something in front of your face. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that Scooby Doo meme where they pull off the mask. <laughs> it was All right. there the whole time. <laughs> Doug, this was amazing. And thank you to thank you to everybody who has been here, whether you've been here live with us and you're not here anymore, like Cameron and Christopher Vogler and Lucy, that this was incredible. But DBJ, thank you so much for being here and retro and bacon, thank James you. bacon and Sable Phoenix. This was absolutely incredible. I hope you enjoyed it, Doug. I'll never um, forget it. This and was all the, <laughs> thank you to everybody in the chat. This you, you guys in the chat are a huge part of everything that we are doing here on this channel with the Heroines Labyrinth and with other things. And if you're not watching live, but you're watching on replay, if you come in on replay, thank you so much for for watching as well. We read the comments that come in afterwards and reply and things like that. So mm -hmm. you are also very much uh, appreciated and are part of what we're doing here. So, all right, everybody, I guess I'll see you on Sunday morning on the Heath's Geekverse channel for the for the morning grind. But then I got to go to Austin and we got to do this live uh, <laughs> for Tuesday night. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> That's awesome. Incredible. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thanks again. Everyone.